Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today um, I'm going to talk about one of the most horrific cases in U.S. history, uh, the Dardeen family massacre, murders, whatever you'd like to call it. It's not pleasant. Um, this has been requested to me over and over during three years. People keep saying, can you do the Dardeen case? Can you do the Dardeen case? And one reason is because there's almost nothing about it on the internet. There's a couple news channel, um, just the news reports, and I will link the best one below that is, I think, <laughs> you, you want your seven minute news report on what, what this case is about. It's the best thing you're going to get. There's a few YouTube channels who did a 12, 15 minute piece on it. And the reason they're so short is because the information is so incredibly limited. And when I went, I did a tremendous amount of research on this. I'm telling you, I don't know how many Google searches I did uh, to try to find out details. And most of the time, what I got was a game of telephone. Somebody would read something someplace and then they would repeat it. Although sometimes they change it just enough to screw it all up. <laughs> so, very difficult case to analyze and a very difficult case to have anything to con constructive as far as information to work with. However, I have found a lot of fascinating things about this case and about the way the case was handled, about what we look at today. Um, there's a lot of stuff. So, but it's going to be a little bit different uh, than people might think. Uh, it's not a straightforward analysis. I'm actually going to bring you in on like, uh, if you were if you were my team, if you were my de uh, detective team, and we were brainstorming, I'm going to bring up a lot of points about this case, which nobody has a clue to actually what happened. <laughs> nobody knows. There seems to be no motive. But the person who did it had no mercy. Okay, uh, we'll get into exactly how this family was brutally murdered and why many people won't cover it. Even Oprah refused to have to, to cover the case on her show because it was too gruesome for a daytime TV. And apparently it's still pretty much too gruesome anywhere. So I want to say this up front. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the patrons who are here in the chat room. Uh, if you would like to participate in the live shows and support the channel, or you don't even have to participate in the live shows, just support the channel. <laughs> Five bucks a month. There are eight live shows for hangouts during the week and for case files on the weekend and other, and other, uh, we have a community chat every week as well, and that supports the channel. If you can't do that, please do like and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell for notifications. Uh, but here's one thing I want to say today. I have demonetized this video. I rarely do this because I try to be very careful about what I say so that YouTube doesn't get annoyed with me. Because when you have a YouTube channel, if you upset YouTube, upset there, it's very, it's very vague, but there's this advertising thing where if you upset the advertisers with content that is displeasing, they can, first of all, demonetize your video, and then they can demonetize your entire channel. Since this is an educational channel, and I want it to stay here so I can continue educating, I am very careful. Uh, I got, I got, I had one video that was flagged, um, and I, it threw me into a whole tizzy uh, because it was very concerning that they flagged it. And so I've been very careful since then. So I have demonetized my own video. This is not a monetized video. There is no advertising on the video, which is exactly the way you earn a living. When you spend many, many hours preparing for a show, doing research and putting the show together and doing the show, it is important that every show gets some level of income. Uh, and this show, because I demonetize it, gets zero. Okay, just point that out because I would like you to note the little dollar sign <laughs> below, the super thanks. If, you, if you're one of the people that really wanted me to work, to, to analyze a Dardeen case, please support this video because it's the only way this video is gonna earn anything for the channel. So little dollar sign below, super thanks. Anything you could give would be fantastic. Uh, but so many people requested this, I thought I have to, I have to do this case because I keep avoiding it, but now I'm going to do it. So are you ready? Because <laughs> this is, this is, okay, uh, I usually don't do a trigger warning because I'm figuring if you're coming to my show, I'm very cautious about what I say on my shows. I do not get into extremely graphic stuff in a fictional way that, you know, it's like, let's, let's feel, let's feel what the murderer is doing. 
and let's be as gory as we can. I don't do that. I'm a criminal profiler. I believe in crime scene analysis, analysis, looking at evidence. So even in this case, I'm going to try to keep this dry, <laughs> as dry as I can. But I know some people aren't going to come here because they're like, I know about that case. Uh, uh, don't want, don't want to hear about it. And I understand that. So the, so the folks in the the chat room right now from uh, Mike, okay, you're here. And I appreciate that. It's fantastic. Um, I've already said hello to most people, but I think I haven't said hello yet to Leslie or Jill. Um, so there you go. You uh, don't, it says, oh, it says here, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, I don't see the dollar sign. Hi, Beverly. No, not during this. This is, this is, this is not public yet. This is, this is the private time for my pa patrons. Okay. Later on about, uh, about a week from now, I will make this public. When it becomes public, uh, the dollar sign is there. So, you know, so you can always come back and hit the dollar sign. And if you're, if you're not a patron and you're, you're viewing this uh, video because you're interested in Dardeen case, you know, I say, I don't always like begging for money, but this is an educational channel and one must survive. But anyway, all right, let's go to this. All right. Now, by the way, you know, I, I put on my red shirt so I could match the Dardines and it looks orange. So, tell you, I'm hot already. Okay. I got to disrobe. All right. Here we go. Now, um, I'm going to read you the little Wikipedia version first. And then I'm going to go back over all the details and tell you where everything doesn't isn't accurate. So one of the problems we have with this case is that the police have released almost nothing as far as details go. All right. And although there's reasons you sometimes do not want to let certain information go because you want to keep that hidden so that if you have you're interviewing somebody like you're going to see later, Tommy Lynn Sells is the number one suspect in this case, uh, in many people's view. Um, and uh, in, in doing so, what you want to do is keep the information so that when you actually have somebody, you're interrogating them or they're they're making claims. Um, where, where, is our, where is that critter? Um, that guy. And I do have some later pictures where you don't see his chest here. <laughs> I'm like, that is so distracting. But... You can see here, this is actually one of their files and it says suspect Tommy Lynn sells. And, um, and this is, this is the mom of, of Keith Dardine. And she used to believe that it was uh, him, but then now she doesn't think so. But I will get into the whole Tommy Lynn sells thing. in in, in the second half of this whole, this whole uh, video, um, let me get him out of my face. Okay. <laughs> he's kind of, he's just, it's, I don't know. I should have gotten a better picture. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but um, the the information in the internet is weak, limited, and often wrong. And it took me forever to find out certain basic pieces of information. And I still can't get enough information because the police department has been so closed mouthed that what I think would help people to help identify the killer of this beautiful family never happened because it's been over 30 years. This is 19, what is it, 1987, 1987. And still there's like zero on this case. I mean, like, and I say zero, but meaning a wee bit. And it's frustrating to me. Uh, and I, again, I'm very, I'm, I'm always with police departments for, okay, don't let that out to the public because the public doesn't need to know that. But there are things they do need to know especially when you've got a cold case and you're trying to solve it, you have to give out enough information where it triggers something in people's minds where they go, oh, I do know something. So I'm going to point all of that out. But let me give you the short version of the horrifying story of the Dardines. All right, straight from Wikipedia, and I'm doing Wikipedia because it is what most people will see originally. And there is there are a few other places that will give information that is slightly different, and I'm going to get into that. On the evening of November 18th in 1987, the police went to the mobile home of Russell Keith Dardeen, uh, and he liked to go by Keith, not Russell. His, he, he was 29 years old. 
and they went to his 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 uh, trailer. And let me just let me just show you a picture of the trailer because this is part of evidence that I think is quite important. This is his trailer. You can see here this location. This is his car, the little red car. And one thing they don't mention is, is that their only car? See, this is, all right, already. I'm already frustrated. I didn't even think of this before. Maybe I did, but I've been up all night. <laughs> this is Keith's car, but his wife works at a, an office supply place. How does she get there? Does Keith drop her off? Does does he, does she use the car when he doesn't? Does he have a different shift than hers? What? What about the car? This is a little, there's, this is their child. Um, and um, the, let me find the child's name, um, which I did know really well. What the heck? Where is it here? Seriously. Um, hold on a second. I forgot the poor child's name here. Um, well, isn't that crazy? You know, you'd think it would be on the top of a, a you think it would be in the right at the front of, oh, there we go. I found it. Oh, it's not under a picture. Peter. This is little Peter. Um, and the time he was three years old. So this is the front. So pay attention to the, the, the location. This is the front and this is the back of the trailer. Now, um, this trailer was on a piece of property, which was, I would say, it was slightly out of town. You know, this is this is the first issue I have. I have no idea where the heck this trailer is. I have been, I wanted to know where in relationship to the town, and what was the town? The town is named Ina. Okay, let me show you just where they where Ina is. Um, I have a ton of map pictures. So as I've told you, map pictures when you're doing things through StreamYard about this big. <laughs> Patience, my dear friends. All right. Uh, this is, uh, you'll see where that little thing, you see that the town in front of you, that's Ina. Um, it's really small, okay? It's really small. It does have a highway going by and a, and, and, a, and a road going through, and it's got a railroad that also goes through, which is important when we come to suspects. And that is as big as the town is. And everything outside is farming community. Um, so they supposedly lived on the outskirts of town. But thank you for not letting us know where the outskirts of town are. Is it north, south, east, west? How far out? That drives me nuts because as a profiler, when you're looking at suspects, you're like, how do they get to this place? Why would they be there? I mean, there's reasons you end up at a location. Uh, either because it's near the bus depot. Let's say you're a dude who takes buses. You get off the bus depot, you take a, a one block walk and you're like, hey, I want to rob that house. That's a reason. Uh, you live in a, an exclusive area of town. You have a big, huge, fancy house and somebody has a vehicle. So they decide to uh, do a home invasion. Why this, why, why this trailer? Well, it was slightly isolated. It appears to me now, in one of the the, uh, the link I put below, you'll have a fellow, this guy, Captain Bobby Wallace from the, the Jefferson County, uh, Illinois Sheriff's Department. And he's standing out kind of where, kind of where the trailer was. And you can see somebody needs, there's just a field, which obviously is not mowed. And then he does a thing. He, he points, what's down that away? <laughs> I'm like, thank you very much, Bobby. All right. It's, down that away. All right. How close to the road is it? How close to the train tracks is it? Where the heck is it? And I do not know. And that's why I've lost a lot of sleep after night going. I'm looking, I'm looking for Dar Dardeen house location address. Can't find it. If you find it, put it in the link below. You know, if, if anybody comes up with a whole bunch of information that I can't find, I will do a part two. <laughs> Just because this, it's frustrating to me when I'm looking at a case that I can't get details that make sense. Now, why is it important to know where this place is? Okay, first problem I have with the police department. If you were in the area, you knew of somebody who was in the area, 
you would want to know kind of where this house is in order to be able to identify the possible person who was involved in this crime. If you don't tell people where the house is, they don't know. Well, I don't know. Was it Northwest, East, South? And, and therefore, once you don't know details like that, you toss it away. Now, are they not saying because, again, they want, I mean, people in town have to know where these people live. So it's not the people in town who don't know. Do they want, like, Tommy Lynn Sells to say, I know exactly where that house was? Tommy Lynn Sells did not say exactly where that house was. I'll get to that. Maybe because it wasn't, wasn't public. Okay, so maybe he could have used that, and he didn't use that. Keep that in mind. But now it's been Frick. Tommy Lynn Sells has been executed. <laughs> He's a serial killer who's been executed. Maybe now's a good time to say, you know, what the heck. Uh, but I don't know where this place is. Okay. But this is what it looked like. He also was uh, selling the house. I mean, selling the trailer. He had uh, Keith had decided that this little tiny town made him uncomfortable and he wanted to actually move home to Mount Carmel, I believe it was, where an hour away where his family was. And he thought, this town has too much violence. It's never explained what the too much violence is. Here we go again. Lack of information. One kid like shot up his family. Okay, that knocked out five people. So you can't really count that as, as a town of violence because that can happen anywhere. It has nothing to do with the town. And then there were some other incidents which are not listed. So I freaking don't know why why Keith might think this is not a place, good place to live and why he'd want to return home. Some people will say it's because Keith was involved in something and was and it was getting scared. Oh, and one of the things I'll point out right here was that sometime before the murders, supposedly some woman, some young woman came to his house and knocked and asked to use the telephone. And he refused her to he refused to refused to admit her and he didn't make a phone call for her. And she went away. That was told by again, great information. Some guy, some person. I don't even know when it happened. If it happened three days before the crime, that's important. If it happened two years before the crime, I don't care. I have no clue. Now the question would be: what the heck is a young woman doing out in this location anyway? <laughs> Why is she out there? Maybe maybe Keith is like, that woman's sketchy. Is that why he didn't help her? I don't know. Was it day? Was it night? Was it what what was her behavior? Was it scary enough that he thought, hey, I'm, I'm not, you know, my family's in here. I'm not letting you in. Why couldn't he make a phone call for her? She wants to use his phone. Why can't he say, give me, give, give me the number. Do you need somebody to pick you up? What was the issue? Well, we don't know because again, this is where. This case is frustrating because where the heck is the information on that? We get this one little piece of garbagey crap. That's a, that's a new terminology, garbagey crap. And then we have no idea what it means, when it happened, what what the circumstances were. Hey, you know, I don't let everybody into my house <laughs> to make a phone call. And so this became a, an issue of how paranoid Keith was living in this location. And then, of course, it, it kind of changed to the fact that, well, if he was that paranoid about her and he wanted to move, was because he was involved in something more hmm, concerning. All right, let me go on with the story. <sighs> okay, so anyway, let's go back to Keith um, and his family. Um, by the way, this is a cute family. They were very, very um, involved in the community. Uh, this is this is one of their Holly, uh, Hollywood no, Halloween pictures, and he dressed up as a Tin Man, and it's a, it was very very cute. Um, Keith, what his wife played at the local church. She was like, I think she did organ. I think it's an organ, and he was a singer at the church. I mean, you're talking about people who are pretty well, you know, just normal citizens of the town involving in themselves in pretty clean habits. Um, supposedly, according to his mother, who I don't know if he can believe his mother, but okay. The mother said he collected tin cans so that he could save up extra money to eventually put his son through college. And that's why he wouldn't have been involved in some nefarious kind of thing like drug trade. Um, I don't, you know, never, moms can be totally honest and moms can be 
questionable. Okay. But anyway, they looked like and appeared to be, and according to everybody, great, a nice family. She was pregnant, seven to eight months pregnant with their soon to be born, unfortunately, I'll get into that, daughter, who was later named Casey. Um, and there's, there were no, there was nothing about this family that was questionable. There was no, there, nobody knew any, of any affairs. Nobody knew of any drug habits. Nobody knew of any gambling habits. He worked at a, uh, he was working at a, um, a water treatment plant. She worked at an office supply store. They had, they had their son. They were going to get another child and they wanted to move back home. This is the kind of family everybody wants to have as a next door neighbor. So, okay, let's go on. So what happened was on the, uh, on the evening of November 18th, 1987, the police went to the mobile home of Russell Keith Darden, Dardeen, and he's called Keith, and his family outside of Ina. Well, I don't have the picture of Ina. I changed my picture. Ina, Ina, Illinois, United States after he failed to show up for work that day. <sighs> Here's one of the problems I had right there. When he didn't show up for work that day. So the police went on November 18th, which was Tuesday. I think I got that correct. <laughs> uh, and they went at 6.30. Let me check my details. Well, sorry, Wednesday. Supposedly, now... To find this information took a lot of work. And you might get lucky and find it right away because I just put the link below. I think that said that. But anyway, he did not show up for work. So the police ended up showing up at his house on Wednesday, 18th, the 18th of November, 1987, at 6.30 p.m. All right. Uh, because he hadn't shown up at work. But here's where everything got me really confusing for me. I looked forever and ever and ever about when when was he supposed to be at work? Was he a day shift, a night shift? What the heck? It's a water treatment plant. You can have many shifts. Because this, this has an impact on when the crime could have gone down or how the crime, how the person who committed the crime could have encountered Keith, depending on the time frame. This is very important when you're doing profiling or investigations. Uh, you can't work with, I don't know what, I don't know when anything happened. It's like, that doesn't help you. So supposedly after I got finally this information came in that he did not show up on November 17th, which was Tuesday night. He did not show up for his 11 p.m. night shift. I thought he was on the day shift for the longest time. I don't know how much sleep I lost over the fact that he could have been on the day shift leaving, leaving his work. And somebody could have gotten in his car with him and all things could have gone bad. But now I find out, no, he didn't show up for his 11 p.m. night shift on. Okay, so he didn't show up on Tuesday. Wait a minute, hold on. Tuesday night at 11 p.m., he didn't show up for the night shift. The whole night shift went by. He never showed. On Wednesday, his, his boss became concerned, started calling, hey, what's calling him? And he's not answering. And this guy was a good worker. So it wasn't, it was like very unusual that he wouldn't show up. And he's calling her now, uh, calling him and getting no response. Now, meanwhile, again, here, I want to talk about lack of information because this is an educational channel. I'm not just here to tell a story like everybody wants me to. <laughs> Other channels for that. I want you to understand how things work. She's supposed to work at an office supply place. Let's see. Wednesday. Wouldn't she be at the office supply place? I don't know where the office supply place is. That's one more piece of information I don't know. Was it in the town of Ina where they lived? Or was it in some other town? I don't know. How did she even get there? <laughs> I don't know about the car situation. Did he drive her? Where was he during while she was working? Mm -hmm. It is three. He wasn't in school. Where the heck? If she's working at an office supply place, where's her son? Did they have the money to pay for her? Their, their family was like an hour away. Where, where did she get? Was her babysitter involved? I haven't heard anything about this. Did he stay home with his son? He did the night shift, stayed home with his son during the day while he slept mostly. 
And his wife took the vehicle and went off to off supply place. Maybe. I don't know. Why do we not hear what? If she was dead when he was dead, why isn't she? Why did what? Why does the office supply place say, where is she? Or did she only work three days a week? Maybe, let's see. Let's see. Uh, they showed up. So Wednesday, clearly, Wednesday during the day, they were all dead by then. Did she only work on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday? Did she only work on the weekends? <laughs> this is what drives me insane. It's like where you know, there's been investigative reporters on this case who haven't done any investigative reporting. I mean, for God's sakes, it is not a big deal. Now, this is not a problem with the police department. I want to know two things. When was the last time he was seen? When was the last time she was seen? And when did their schedule go awry? Can't we know what his schedule is? Like, he works this these days. He was there. Da, 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 da. She works these days. She was there. Da, 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 da. Why don't we know that crap? Why is that not, I think that's not, that's not a, that's not something the serial killer, should there be one, or the killer should, well, there is one, but whoever did them in, this is not some secret information he would necessarily have any clue about. But if the people of the town and the people later on and would have some clue about this, they would have maybe more information to work with, to give good tips. I have no clue where she worked when she worked or when she didn't show up for work. Pisses me off. For this guy, I what I do know now, because I used to think he walked the, worked the day shift because there was only one place that said he worked the night shift. I'm like, oh, that makes, that, that changes things. All right. So on November 17th, which is a Tuesday, he didn't show up for his 11 p.m. night shift. So all night long, he wasn't there. His boss became concerned. His boss started calling on Wednesday and getting no answer from him, no whatever. And we're talking 1987, so, you know, no cell phones here. And apparently the family got contacted. The family, one hour away, knew that the family didn't seem to be responding. He didn't show up for work. I don't know why the family didn't jump in the car and just go straight to the trailer and knock on the door. A lot of people have commented on that. What's wrong with that family? So finally, they contact the police and his dad, who is not still married to his mom, says he has keys. So the police and the police show up, meet the dad, show up at the trailer on Wednesday, the 18th at 6.30 p.m. Okay, so now, you know, it's a long time uh, since they, you know, if he didn't show up for his work on uh, November 17th at 11 p.m., He'd been dead a long time, and so was the family. Um, so the whole the whole night went by, the whole next day went by, with no one realizing this, this whole family had already been murdered. So please show up at 6.30 p.m. on the next day. And um, apparently when they show up, the, the, the father had keys. But And then we get into some, again, stuff that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so... Now, mind you, I, I looked up when it gets dark in, in November 18th in uh, 1987. What a sunset. By the time 6.30 came, it was dark. So they arrive at, at, at this trailer. And um, the father has the keys. But he doesn't open the front door and go in. Now, mind you, the car is not there. Let me show you the picture again of the car. Um because the car plays a really important point here. Um, where did my car go? Sorry, hold on a second. Oh, there we go. All right. This car, which I don't know is their only car, but maybe be the only car. First of all, it's red. And let me point out that I drive a red Mazda Miata. And when you look around at cars on the road, there's not that many red cars. So this is, an outs this is a car that will stand out. Anyway, the car wasn't there. There's the front door, apparently. This is the back. Now, the father has a key, and apparently they don't actually go in that way. And they find the back door is unlocked, which, according to everybody, is like, oh, my God, the guy's so paranoid, he wouldn't, he would lock up the house. All right. Um, then they say that they found the back door unlocked. <laughs> they also said 
that somehow they took a flashlight, I guess, peeked into the house and saw the dead bodies of the wife and, and, and son, which cannot be seen through the, the door in the back because they were found in a bed. So did they actually mean they went, looked in a back, I guess the back window? And then the question is, I, I'm looking here. I don't know when this picture was taken because this kid's alive over here and over here, I don't know. I mean, I am a person has no curtains in my windows. I hate curtains with a passion. I've never used curtains any place. So, uh, except for that one over there, because I have to block the light coming in for that ruins my show. But other than, actually, that's that's my Indian nightgown. But all right, I have no I have no window and curtains. That, I've never had curtains. I hate curtains. I love the light. Most people have curtains. Most people have. Not only curtains, they, they have like the inside curtain and the, the darker curtain, They especially with a bedroom. Now, I don't know why they could look into a bedroom and see people in there because were the curtains never drawn? Now, that's important. Were the curtains not drawn because this didn't happen at night? In the middle of the night, is it possible they would have drawn? Oh, okay, again, what is, uh, was, let me, let me, let me tell, tell you the time for, uh, I took a picture of this. Um, at that point in time, uh, when was sunset? Okay. On Tuesday, November 17th, 1987, sunset was at... What the heck is that? I got... I'm sorry. Whatever I just copied did not come in. It was like 4.30 in the afternoon. Start to be sunset. Uh, it's early. Now, it's possible if they weren't going to bed, they left the curtains open. And therefore, if the, the, the family was, the, the wife and child were killed, they were put in the bed, that the curtains were still open. But they see these things matter. These things matter. All right. So anyway, the police found them. And this, and again, I don't know the details and nothing makes a lot of sense. But anyway, the police get there and they found, this is what they found. They're at the, at the trailer, they found the bodies of his wife and son, both brutally beaten. Ruby Elaine Dardine, and we'll call her Elaine from now on because Ruby is her first name, but she also went by her second name, Elaine. Elaine Dardine, 30, who had been pregnant with the couple's daughter, had been beaten so badly she had gone into labor. And the killer or killers had also beaten the newborn to death. This is what makes this case something that people run away from because the thought of a, a, a small Earl, the, ch the child was like, in, you know, a preemie coming out of Elaine's body and then being beaten to death is not exactly pleasant. All right. The killings had apparently taken place the day before. Investigators at first believed that Keith was a prime suspect. Now, why is that? Because his car wasn't there. You find a family beaten to death, a pregnant wife, their three-year-old son, and, and the little teeny preemie baby who, this is what happened. During the attack, she went into labor and the baby was born and the killer beat the baby after the baby was born. I will get into some issues on why, why a killer would do that. Uh, because if you're a psychopath, that might not be such a stretch. All right, so... They're buying, uh, they're fine. They're thinking family annihilate that, that Keith lost his mind, killed off his wife, his son, and his new baby daughter, and then took his car and, and, and raced out of town. So they went to his Keith's mom's house. Um, let me show you his mom. So they they go to her house and they show up there with guns and everything because they're like, they think that this guy's a killer, right? And they definitely think that. Um, his mom. There she is. Um, this is Joanne Dardine, who's been fighting for years to find out what happened to her son. Um, Joanne, so they show up there and they got guns. They're like, where's your son? And she's like, what? <laughs> well, and and don't blame the police. And 99% 9 of the time, 99% of the time, this would be true. All right. But that's not what happened. So they couldn't find him. Uh, and then what happened was the next day, his body was found in a nearby field. 
he had been shot and his genitals mutilated. And when they say genitals mutilated, because this is uh, Wikipedia, his uh, penis was cut off. There are stories. Now, here's where stories start again. His own mother says the penis was then placed in his mouth. Others say this is just a rumor. I don't know whether mom got the story from the rumor or mom got the story from the police. I don't know that is any validity. Now, this is important because when you're talking about crime scene evidence, you're looking at motivation and behaviors. There's, I mean, it's bad enough that you do a chopo thing. Or where is it? If, you know, if you're chopping a piece of somebody's body off, where did it go? Did you take it with you as a souvenir? Did you take it back to the home to say, you're not going to use this on you anymore? And I, I apologize for being, <laughs> for my sense of humor, which people are sometimes offended by. But this is the way, this is the way killers think. They might take it back and say, well, it's not going to do you much good anymore. I got a better one here. That may be the way they think. Or when, when a penis is placed into the mouth of the person they took it off of, this is something that has been done in Vietnam during the wars. In other words, you can do something to somebody when you take off a body part and then you, you humiliate them with it. It's like, like the best thing you can possibly do if you're that killer. It's done by the Mexican cartels. Cartels have done some just disgusting things. And the other day, and this is a good reason why you want to really want to be careful about Twitter. All right, because I have two Twitter accounts, but the thing that offends me about Twitter is that in the in in the Twitter feed, you will get videos that are functioning. You don't have to click on them, they're functioning. And I never look at Twitter feeds in front of my granddaughter because I was rolling through a Twitter feed. And I saw this on the Twitter feed. I saw a man in a, in a war situation, which is very recent. And I'm not going to get into all politics here. The killer cut off his leg. And on the video, I saw the man's leg get cut off. And then he picked up the leg and knocked the guy, knocked the, the victim on the cheek with his own leg. I want to throw up. Absolutely wanted to throw up. But the, the person who did that was laughing because to him it was amusing. So we have to take these things into account. So I don't know what actually happened to Keith Dardine. I know there def definitely somebody had sliced off his penis. This is true. I don't know what happened to it. I just hear the stories. And one of the stories is it was placed in his mouth. Don't know if that's true, but that would be useful in knowing as far as the behavior goes, what happened. But this is one of the reasons that um, nobody will cover the story because it is, it's, it's horrifying. It is horrifying. So anyway, they found his body. He'd been shot. And here we have some other issues about being shot. Uh, I've heard that he was shot twice. I've heard that he was shot three times. I was heard he was shot in the back of the head like an execution and two other shots to his face. I've heard they were shot three times in the face. I have not a clue how he was shot. Now, here I'm on the police side. You do not need to know how he was shot. If you, I mean, we're talking about if the police are trying to reach out to the public, the, the police do, here, two couple things. The police do not actually need to tell the public that his penis was cut off. They do not need to tell the public where the penis ended up. They do not need to tell the public how many times he was shot and where he was shot. These are things, yes, the killer himself would only know. We do not need to know these things because they could use that. If I hear that somebody sh shot somebody three times, it doesn't mean anything for me to identify. Um, I would say maybe the cutting off the penis thing might have some, some meaning in that. I, I knew somebody who had fantasies of that, for example. How he was shot, where he was shot, none of that is going to help me identify. What you want to give to the public is information that will help you identify the person. Now, what they didn't tell the public, which bugs me, is what the gun was that shot him. Because that is useful. Uh, let's say he was shot with a 22 or a 38 or, or what do you, what was he shot with? A nine millimeter. What was he shot with? 
because that will tell you what kind of weapon this person was carrying with them. That person may have stolen it. They may have bought it. Uh, they may have borrowed it. And sometimes killers will even say, hey, can, can you hold on to this gun for me? Can you just hide it someplace? <laughs> and you wouldn't believe this is true. Like they'll give it to like a best friend or a brother or a father or a cousin. Can you just put this away for me? Because don't, don't talk to the police. And so somebody might say, oh, I got this 22. And then they hear about the Dardeen crime. The guy was shot with a 22. They might contact the police and they have the actual weapon. So to me, the police should definitely tell the weapons. The killer already knows the police know what the weapon is. If he wants to get rid of it, he's going to get rid of it anyway. They sh if it's a knife, tell him it's a knife. Tell what kind of knife it is. If it's a gun, say what kind of gun it is. Because the killer, I say he already knows you know, police officers. So he will ditch it or not ditch it. But if you say something, there might be a link to where he got that gun or where he gave that gun. And that might help identify the killer. I don't care. Yeah, don't say how many times he got shot. Because let's say you get somebody in your interview room and you say, okay, how did you shoot this guy? And, and that guy says, I was behind him in the vehicle. I shot him once in the back of the head. And then as he fell over, I got out of the vehicle, pulled, his, pulled him out, and I shot him twice in the head. And that's true. Well, now you do have good information because only the killer would know that. So keep information, police detectives, police departments, that are important to that only the killer would know, but don't keep information that would help the citizens identify the guy because a lot, good portion of the time, you'll never know who the guy is anyway. <laughs> you know, you know. So it's better to get information that will identify the guy than to keep everything away that won't identify the guy. So the whole thing about how he was shot is concerning to me, but he was, they found his body. Now this is another thing that drives me crazy. Okay, so, okay, that's not the picture. Hold on a second. So they found his body. The first claim I read was in a field. And I saw this picture on someplace. Well, there's a field. But I don't think that's the field. I think that the news show just used a picture of freaking field. Okay, so I don't think that's even true. Uh, because he was found in a specific place. Now, is a specific place important? Yes. All right, let me, let me show you some of the issues about the place where he was found. All right, I'm going to try to figure out my pictures here. Okay, that's a picture of his trailer. Okay. All right. Now, if none of you don't know where Ina... Uh, Illinois is no, you know, unless you live there, you probably don't. So anyway, this is a picture of the town, which I showed you before. All right. Now this is a picture. Ina is at the top. Okay. And down below at the bottom is a place called Benton. Now try to keep some of this in mind because I say it's a little confusing and believe me, if I spent hours doing this, I'm trying to trying to make it easier for you, but it's, it is convoluted. The family was killed in Ina. The, 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 the wife, the three-year-old, and the, and, the, and the infant, the, the premature infant, was killed. they were killed up in Ina, which is where they lived in the trailer. Down there at the bottom, you'll see a place called Benton. Benton is where the car, the red car that the husband drove, was found. It, uh, people keep saying it's 11 minutes, and then this says it's 60 minutes. I don't know. I guess it depends on the time of day somewhere between 11 and 16 minutes from this house straight south to a place called Benton, which is another town where the car was found. The coal where the car is found is fascinating as well. Now, let's see. All right, where was his body found? Okay, so we got the family. We know the family's dead in the house. Um, what is the, but, the, but the husband's body is not there. So the husband's body... There, now, there is, there is uh, here's another piece of information. It's a piece of crap. There's blood in the car. Quote, blood spatter. Now, we've never heard whether any of the blood from the family inside, they were beaten with, with a baseball bat. The son's baseball bat was what killed them. The guy beat them and the little baby with the baseball bat. I'll get into the whole crime scene here. But I just wanted to say that they were beaten. And there was blood, supposedly, again, supposedly, because the information is so horrible, in the car. 
I don't know where it was in the car. Was it in the front seat, the passenger seat, the back seat? Again, information is sketchy. Now, what does blood spatter mean? There was blood in the car. And again, this is a telephone game. I don't have absolute information what the blood was. Um, was, was any of their blood in the car? And if not, that's interesting. Was his blood in the car because it was obvious that he was shot in the car? Because when you're shot, let's say you're shot, you can have blood spatter pattern that's clearly from the actual shot that, that threw the blood in the direction it threw the blood. Or was the blood from the, the fact that his uh, penis was cut off? And was there blood from that? Or did was there no blood in the car and he was driven to a location, pulled out of the car, shot, his penis was cut off, and the guy who got back in the car had blood on his knife and went like this, had blood on his clothing, blood on his knife, and it made it look like, well, this guy's blood is in the car and there's some spatter on the ceiling, but did it come from what happened in the car or did it happen outside the car and was brought into the car? Got, I haven't got a clue. All right. So I don't know. So we're going to get into later whether, whether he was killed first or whether they were killed first. It's very, very difficult to figure out. So anyway, his car was not there. But his car ended up in, in this location, which is going to be interesting. And I am doing this as if you were you know, with me in a, in a room and we're doing discussions and we're doing brain uh, brainstorming. People would like everything to be clean cut because I get a lot of complaints. Oh, Pat, you're all over the damn place. I can't follow you. Well, you can't follow me because you're looking for a story. You want to go from A to B and you're done. It isn't like that because this is what the police go through. And I'm trying to teach what the police go through and what a profiler goes through. So this guy is in, at some point is in his vehicle. Somebody is with him in the vehicle because somebody drives him to a location where he ends up dead. All right. This is what they said, a field. But it's not really a field because let me show you the picture. This is actually the location he's found at. You see, that's the police. In. It's like in a freaking woods next to a field, maybe. But it's not actually a field. So who, who, what is this nonsense? I don't even understand where he's actually at. But there is some information where he's at. Let me show you where he's at. He's in a place called, oh, hold on a second. Wrong picture. Mm, Got to go back up. Hold on a second. Uh, that's not it. Okay, here we go. Okay, that's not it either. Hold on a second. Just give me a chance here. Rend Lake College. All right. Do you see up on your right-hand corner, you'll see, a, you'll see Ina. Now, he lives someplace on the outskirts of town. And again, I have not a clue. North, south, east, west. He lives sort of outside in a little bit of a crap, uh, just a not an overly populated area. He, he lived on a plot where I think the owner of the plot rented out the spot to him. And so there was a person who did live on the same plot nearby, but not that close. All right. So anyway, he's somewhere near Ina. And the... Rend Lake College is one uh, uh, one mile supposedly south and across the highway from the property, at least that I know of, because again, I don't know much. Um, there is this college and his body is supposedly found somewhere around there. Now, they keep saying at, at Rend, Rend Lake, was it Rend Lake? Rend Lake College, at Rend Lake College, or is it near Rend Lake College? Is it behind Rain Lake College? What does near mean? Is it how near? <laughs> I don't know. Somewhere, because I'm looking around I'm, you know, on the campus would not be a great idea. How much area does Ren Lake own? Or is it not really at Ren Lake College, but at, a, at some location, you see the areas that are empty somewhere nearby? I don't know. But what does interest me is that this is about a mile from what happened was up in Ina. One mile later, it's south. Somebody dumped his body somewhere around Ren Lake College. And take a look at this picture. I'm sorry, not that picture. Where is my picture? Oh, there it is. Okay, so now this is the location. Now, why do I want to know exactly where it is if I were investigating or profiling? I want to know how far off his body was from a road, from someplace the car could drive, because this would uh, make a difference on whether 
uh, the victim was let out of the car and killed or whether somebody carried him out of the car. I don't know how close the body was to a, a place where somebody could pull the car over. I don't know. So now we have, let's go back and take a quick look. Oh, by the way, also people point out, so this is Ren Lake College, by the way. And on the right side is Big River, Muddy River Correctional Center. Mm, yeah. Um, nobody really talks about any, that any escaped prisoners were out there like doing anything. So I don't think that the, the correctional center has much to do with it. Except for, and I'll say this, I don't think there were no escaped prisoners, but I'll say something about the guards at some of these prisons. Some of you guards, I love you dearly because I, you know, when it comes down to people doing a job like that, working in jails, working in prison, it's a hard job. And you do a good job and you're a, a great citizen and I appreciate it. But you also know, having been a guard, that you got some sketchy dudes working with you. <laughs> some psychopathic guards working with you. It's true in the it's true in the bouncer business, it's true in the jail business. It just is true. Drugs do get into prisons for a reason. So anyway, you got some sketchy people. Then because the prison was extremely close to where the body was left, we cannot completely say that couldn't be an issue. Now, somebody else that was pointed out, see Ina there in the middle of the map, the college was actually a little bit below the, 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 the they, they went from Jefferson County to Franklin County, left the body of the, the husband, Keith, in, in Franklin County at the college or near the college or whatever it is. And somebody said, well, that's because the guy's so smart, he knows to cross state, uh, to cross county lines to confuse the police. Well, maybe if the guy lived in the area, he'd know that. If he were Tommy Lynn Sells, he wouldn't have a clue. So keep that in mind. Again, we're going to keep a lot of ideas in mind to try to figure out in the long run what happened. All right. So now I'm going to get to, I want to go to your comments in a minute, uh, but I just want to set the whole thing up. So now after his body was found in this field, it was found a day later. And also they found the car uh, 11, 16 miles south in that place called Benton. All right, let me show you Benton. Where did Benton go? There we go. So now we have Ina at the top, Benton at the bottom. So somebody, if you if you look kind of in the middle there, actually, I want to show you another picture. Uh, okay, I don't know if I have the other picture. Where's my other picture? Hold on a second. I'm going to go through a bunch of crap here. Uh, that's not good. Um, I want to show you where he, where he worked. Uh, okay, there we go. All right, Ina's up above, about halfway between Ina and Benton. When you see the row go to the left, that is where the water treatment center is, I think, that the husband worked at. I only point this out because where does the husband work? It could be important because it could be somebody at the treatment center you work with. It could be the location. We don't know. Um, I don't even know it's where actually, I know he worked at a water treatment center. I know it was for that particular area. But, and I think that's where it is because I looked it up on map, but do I actually know? Hold on a second. I got sneeze. <laughs> oh, okay. Only two. Usually I sneeze like 10 times. Anyway, um, that's where he worked. So he worked like halfway between his house and Benton. And I, oh, I point this out because if we're looking at what could have happened, this might be an issue. Uh, well, there's somebody who was with him at work and this would be, this became an issue whether he was a day worker or an evening worker. And so there you go. It's a mess. But that's where he worked. And the the uh, so he was south of his house and south of the college, but probably about halfway to Benton. Now, when you get down to Benton, all right, you come down the highway there and you turn in. And this is where the car is found. Uh, now, we have a lot of interesting claims. The claim is that the car is found at the see that spot there. That's the Benton Police Department. Let me see what I'm find. There you go. Uh, Benton, this is the Benton Police Department. The claims are that his car was found parked near the police station in Benton. This becomes a big issue. So why was it parked? Some people thought it was parked at the police station or across from the police station. And also there's this other place there. There's... um. Let me show you a couple other ones here. So, yeah. Oh, it was parked at the police station. No, but it was right near the, the big courthouse where there's a huge drug case going on. So it must have been a message. 
is a message, you know, because it was parked at the police station in, in Benton. So it must be a message either about the police or about, or about the, um, uh, or about the drug issues that, that the, the, the Dardines have never been connected to. And there's not one shred of information that Keith Dardine had anything to do with drugs. Um, but could he? It's possible. Um, but now he's down. Now the car is found down at what is near the police station, at the police station, near the courthouse. Can you can you tell us where the car is? <laughs> now, here's an interesting thing. Is this so important that you need to have the killer tell you exactly where he parked the vehicle? Because a lot of times, if you're looking at a killer who is not from the town, he probably doesn't remember where he parked the damn car. So, I mean, how important is that? But if you had originally told people this is where we found the car, and again, look at this car. It's red. <laughs> if you park that car at night and you walk away from it, the car that might mean something. Maybe somebody saw you walking away from the car. Maybe there's a reason you parked in that location. And it's an obvious red car, as opposed to most cars are gray, black, white. They're not red. So it's kind of noticeable. But there's also a story that, no, it actually wasn't parked at the police station. It was parked in, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, I'm saying some better pictures here. Uh, that's not a good picture. Um, oh, is that a good picture? Let's see, where are we at here? Oh, yeah. Um, the police station is actually in the right corner on North Washington, uh, West Washington Street. But you see below there is a place called Le Legion's Bank. I think it's called Legion's Bank. There is There are stories a few comments someplace on the internet that don't know it wasn't parked at the police. It was parked in the parking lot of the Legion's Bank. Look at the Legion's Bank there. Look at the parking lot that goes way up to West Washington Street. And the, and the police uh, station is uh, one block over. Uh, well, probably where that green tree is on Washington Street to the right. Um, so did he park in just the parking lot of the, at the, at the uh, bank, which didn't mean he was focused on the police station or the courthouse? Was it just a convenient place to park? He moved, came into town, parked at the at the bank there in that big parking lot, and then walked away. Or was his other was his car actually his real car in that parking lot? And he just pulled next to it, jumped into his vehicle, and, and drove away. That's why it's important that the police said exactly where the heck the car was. Don't just keep that a big secret. Still to this day, thirty years later, was it at the police station? The where the hell was the car? Was it at the bank parking lot? And I don't know. It drives me nuts because I'm like, how are you going to have people d figure anything out if you, you're not even going to say where the heck the car was at? So we don't know exactly where the car was. And that plays into the motive of the crime because people say it was drug related and that's where there was a big drug case going on. So it was a, uh, it was a, it was a, some kind of, you know, hey, you know, we killed all these people because of you and we'll park next to the, the, because of you. You know, we're pissed off. First of all, I'm going to say it's all nonsense. That is not the way drug people work. <laughs> it's a bunch of garbage. <laughs> it really is. And the way they that the way that the Dardines were killed really doesn't match. Uh, like a drug mafia killing off people, the, uh, the Mexican cartels, which weren't there at the time. It's not the way they do things. So this is just a bunch of nonsense. If you're going to leave a message, you leave a message that's obvious. You don't leave a message where you go, I wonder why the Dardines were killed. I wonder why they did that. I wonder why the part, you know, there's no message. And when you want to leave a message, leave a damn message you can actually read. <laughs> you know? I mean, if that's your point, otherwise, what's, what are you doing? And I'm thinking, what the heck could Keith Dardine have done so badly in some drug thing? And his mother says, oh, maybe, maybe he refused to sell drugs or something for them. Now that happens in Mexico. It doesn't happen in <laughs> in a small town in the United States where somebody says, hey, can you sell for us? And you say no, and they kill your whole family and stick your penis in your mouth. No, that's not the way things work. So that makes no sense. I see zero evidence that he's connected to the uh, drug trade at all. Um, or this, this case looks like a drug thing at all. And I'm going to get into that. There is a guy out there who's pushed this, and along with the Tommy Lynn Sells thing, he's pushed this, and you're going to see why, and you're going to be amazed at how people can create connections between dots that don't exist because they're trying to they're trying to win a case 
and uh, they don't care about the truth or anything that makes sense. They'll just put it out there as long as it causes people to be confused. So, so here we are, some guy or some guys, we don't know. It could be two people involved somehow access the, 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 the house of the Dardines where supposedly Keith Dardine was nervous about anybody coming around. And was he home or wasn't he home at the time that this person accessed their house? Where, where his, was his family home alone and then he arrived? In other words, they killed his family and then he arrived. Or was he already there and somehow did open the door and somebody came in with a gun and controlled the scene and then killed the family and took him away, killed him, and then took the car down to 11 miles south to Benton for some reason and walked away from it the car. Were there two people involved? One controlling the family at the house and the other one taking away the husband. And then that guy with the car that came to the house went and picked up the guy in Benton. How did anybody get to the house to begin with? If they weren't in his car, if they didn't come in with the husband, why do they, I'm sorry, uh, Ina, if they weren't in the husband's car and arriving at the house, why were they in Ina? And if they had a, their own car, why did they take this car to Benton? Then they'd have to get, how would they get back to their car? unless there were two people or did, or did some guy just come wandering around town, coming off the railroad tracks, like Tommy Lynn sells, find that house, stake it out, kill these people, use the car and go South. And that's what a lot of people think. Yeah. Before I, I'm going to check your comments in a second. And then I'm going to go to Tommy Lynn sells. And then I will go back to what I think is more likely considering the situation. How were they killed is important um, uh, because we haven't gotten into that. The person who came into the house supposedly duct taped the mother and the son. And um, I'll read you the story from Tommy Lynn Sells. Well, I don't know. It's even true at all. But somebody it's a, he duct taped these two supposedly. There's two stories. One is that they arrived and they found duct tape on her. I don't know about him. They never mentioned him. There's another story that there was only residue from the duct tape, which means that the person removed the duct tape in order to remove evidence from the scene, which is interesting. But supposedly these were duct taped. Their, their hands were duct taped. Their mouths were duct taped so they couldn't scream. Um, and at some point, supposedly, her legs, her legs were not duct taped together, whether they were and were unduct taped or whether they were never duct taped. I don't know. At some point, the son was beaten to death with a, his own baseball bat that his dad had given him, just basically hit on the head. What happened with uh, Elaine is another question. There is there. I've heard that she was not sexually assaulted. I don't know how they would possibly know that when, when she was supposedly beaten with a bat so badly that she went into premature labor, baby came out of her body, still attached to the umbilical cord and the killer beat the baby to death. How would you know? Unless the guy, unless the guy ejaculated, you would have pretty much no idea whether he did rape her. Um, he could have also used a condom. We don't know if he actually had raped her, and during the rape, that caused her body, along, along with everything else that was going on, that caused her body to go into premature labor. It could be during the rape that the labor started. And then when it started, the guy's like, no, oh, good God almighty. And he backs off. And then the baby's born. And little baby, premature babies, they're not screaming loud enough. They have to worry about the neighbors hearing them and saying, what's going on at that house? They, they, But they have that cute, actually have a very cute little baby. <laughs> But enough to annoy a psychopath, enough that he don't want to hear it, and he would stop it from making that noise. So I don't know whether he raped her, and in the rape process she went into labor, and then he beat the baby and he beat her to death. Or he was beating her over the head with a baseball bat, and she went into labor, and the baby was born, and then he beat the baby. I do not know. There is also a story that the, the baseball bat, the smaller end was inject or pushed into her vagina. I don't know if that's true or not either. 
because the important thing about that would be whether this was a focused rape issue or whether there was no rape involved. If there's no sexual assault involved, we have something, it, it, it changes the way we look at the crime. Um, now, the, the, the cutting off of the husband's penis is not necessarily sexual. We see, I said, we see that in, we see that in Mexican cartels and in Vietnam and just people just want to be mean. It's, it's a humiliation technique. It's not necessarily sexual. But a rape of a woman is sexual. Um, not that the guy needed sex, but that's what you do to humiliate the woman. And a lot of guys enjoy that power and control, especially serial killers. So that's important with the Tommy Lee, uh, the Tommy Lee, I'm sorry, Tommy Lincell's issue, because he was a serial killer and a serial rapist. Now, she was, she ended up, the baby died. Now, here's another interesting stupidity point, which drives me nuts. You hear this, the one thing that is clear across a lot of sites is that the, the, the mom and the little baby and her, her, her beautiful little son were all tucked into the bed. And this is a point, I'm going to go to your comments right after this, that after they were brutally murdered, the killer tucked them into the bed. Some people say, well, that shows remorse. I'm, I'm pretty sure if you beat a, a pregnant woman, a baby, and a little boy to death with a baseball bat. You don't have any remorse. You're a psychopath of the nth degree. There's no remorse in that. But they were supposedly tucked into the bed. Now, here we go. Were they tucked into a bed, or is this just something that was said once and is, tell again, it's all over the internet, as few places out there actually are. Were they tucked in? Now, I read someplace they had a water bed, which I actually happen to own. So a water bed, uh, you know, it isn't as flat across, you know, it's not as strong. And when your bodies are on it, 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 it goes like this a little bit, not as much as people think in the old days of the seventies where people didn't put enough water in the bed. <laughs> but usually what you have is a, I don't have this, but you have a, a wood frame. I have a lovely cushion over it. I love water beds. I've been, been in one for 30 years. It's wonderful for my, I just feel comfortable and I, I snuggle in it and it all fits my body and you can change the heat. Not the prettiest things in the world, but hey, but they're prettier than they were in the 70s. And so they suppose they had a water bed. Now, my question is this. First of all, who said he moved the bodies to the water bed? Who said he didn't already have them in the water bed? Because he might have, he might have, when he supposed, supposedly taped them up, put the kid in the bed, woman in the bed, and they were already in the bed. And then when he attacked her, they he was already raping her in the bed. The baby's born in the bed. He beats the rest of them with a baseball bat. And then he gets out of the bed. Now, did he just throw a coverlet over them? Were they even covered? I don't know. Now, at some places, don't just say they were on the bed. On the bed is different than being covered up in the bed. But, you know, sometimes a guy will just pick up the thing and just chuck it over them, not because of remorse, just because he's like, well, I'm done with you guys or he's trying to cover up the crime scene to some extent. So people peeking in windows don't see dead people lying there. And if they peeked in the window and saw a couple people in there, they might just think they're sleeping. So I don't know what condition they were actually in, in the bed, because that is not clear, but I don't, it's not remorse. A hundred percent is not remorse. So I would like to know whether she truly, I personally think the chances of her being raped were probably pretty high, even though they said they didn't see any sign that she wasn't sexually assaulted. Once you have a baby, I'm pretty much saying that your body is, uh, has experienced, uh, uh, a level of, of, you know, expanding and all of that. And, and the roughness of birth, I think it would obscure unless you've got semen. I don't think you could possibly say she wasn't raped. Again, she could have had, that could have had a condom, he could never have ejaculated, he could have been raping her, and, and then she went into labor, and then he just pulled out and said, this is, this is disgusting. Uh, that's just reality. I think she was raped. That That's my that's my belief. Um, so I don't think there's any remorse. I think that, I think rape was clearly some, so whether you have one or two people, the question is, was it one person who was involved in this, or was it two people involved in this? one off killing the husband and one off raping the wife. But, you know, to get two people to do two pretty gruesome scenes is, is kind of unusual. And then the question is, why didn't they just kill the husband when he was there? 
I mean, if they were there, if the whole family was together, why do you need to drive them away? Why not just kill them and drive away? I mean, some will say, well, it's because he, the person bought time by taking his car away and putting his car, uh, body in a field. It took the police an extra day to figure out that the husband didn't kill them. And then they start looking for you. But, you know, if this is done in the middle of the night or early in the evening, you're probably out of there. Now, he spent some time supposedly cleaned up. And again, I don't know if he cleaned up the crime scene or he never actually cleaned up the crime scene. I don't know if that's a bunch of bull, too. Um, whether he's cleaning up just after what he thought he left. But there was still supposedly blood there. So I don't know. But, I mean, once he left there and he drove south a whole 11 miles, he's already gone. If he's jumping on a train, if he's jumping on a, a whatever, He's, by the time they even found out that people were dead, he was eight hours gone anyway to either his home where he cleaned up or he took care of his car. I, I can't see that in this moment. He's like, I think what I'll do is take the husband away and make it look like he killed them. Well, if you're going to make it look like he killed them, maybe sticking his penis in his mouth wouldn't be. That's kind of a clue that he didn't do it. You know, you, if you want a guy to look like he killed him, you have to shoot the guy in the side of the head and you leave the gun there. You don't shoot him three times and cut his penis off and put it in his mouth. That doesn't actually make people think that the guy's guilty. <laughs> so this is this is the whole, as best I can, to try to get you the, some of the concepts here um, about how this crime went down. Uh, but what's questionable in this whole crime is the motive. Why they were killed, were, were there one or two people was this complete stranger just a serial killer like Tommy Lynn Sells? Was this somebody who had a motive against, in my opinion, would be against the husband, Keith, um, because they, he, he was because of what they did, what that person did to them or they did to him? Um, that, in other words, they killed him, they emasculated him, and they raped, in my opinion, raped his wife, killed his son, killed his babies. Um, that's pretty focused on you're, we're, you, you're the one I don't like. Um, but then serial killers sometimes do weird stuff, stuff like that just for the fun of it. Uh, my question a lot of time is, will be about where the vehicle was, why the vehicle was put in Benton. All right. Um, the vehicle is put in the middle of town when it could be put near the railroad tracks. It could be put near the highway. It could be put someplace where nobody will see you walk away from it. Why is it in Benton? In the middle of town near the police station or the bank. Or whatever. Why is it in the middle of town? Middle of the night, probably. So nobody may, the person, does the person know the town? And this is what I'm going to get at in a little bit. Did the person know the town? Did the reason they have to go to Benton was because that's where they live. That's where they left their vehicle. Did the person know the area to know where that college was, where they, they put the body behind? Because that was a weird spot. Why would they know where they even lived? That's, that's bizarre to me too. So is this a local person who had a grudge of some sort, or is it Tommy Lynn Sells, a drifter who came into town, who sometimes claims he was doing a hit for the drug cartel? Is it him? So now I'm going to stop here, check out your comments, and then I'll go to Tommy Lynn Sells. And you've got 700,000. <laughs> this is such a complicated case. It really is without good information. <sighs> so I'm going to look at some of your points here. Um, is is there a bus to get out of town where he parked? There is a bus. Usually these, all these places have a bus station, a Greyhound station. It might not be an actual station, but it might be there. Uh, but as far as we know, they, I would assume they would have, again, a, the information in this case sucks, which is why so few people know what to do with it. Um, could he have moved, come to Benton, particularly so that, Early morning, five or six o'clock in the morning, you could have bought a ticket and left. Yes. Would the police have checked that out? One would hope. One would hope. Um, uh, Jill, if there was more than one perpetrator, could they have left the car at the scene in the field? Thank you, investigative team. Um, okay. So theoretically, let, let's go through it. Um, so you got a guy. You got two dudes. And they're going to take this. They're going to take this family out. So let's say they go to the the, the home, and now they've got, one guy's got a gun. Uh, the knife has never been found. I don't think it was a knife from their home. The baseball bat was from their home. Um, they go in there. They corral the family, and one of the, so so they kill the family 
and the, they put the, the husband in the car, Keith, and the other one follows the car wherever they're going until he kills the guy and then he jumps in the other car and leaves. That is a possibility. Um, that certainly has to be explored. And then that is true. Well, I'm sorry. Here, oh, wait a minute. I just screwed that whole thing up. <laughs> if it, wouldn't you think if you take him behind the the college in some field, which I don't know has anything to do with the college, whether well, the guy knows the college is there. It's, again, it's a weird spot where he supposedly was put where there's better places to just disappear. But anyway, I don't not actually know this the field. But anyway, or the roads or whatever the heck he's in. So anyway, let's say the two cars go. This one and the guy following with the with his own their own car. They go to this field. Wouldn't it be easier to leave the car here where the body was? Because then it would look like the husband drove there, right? And got and killed himself and cut his penis off and stuck in his mouth. Okay. But you know, wouldn't that be more sensible if you were trying to pin it on the husband? Wouldn't it be easier just to leave the damn car there, take your own car and just get the hell out of town? Why would you go to why would you take this car to Benton, 11 miles south, and park it in the freaking middle of town if you've got another car? What's the purpose? Now, some people will say, uh, because they want to pin it on the police or on the drug thing. I just don't see any, I, I don't see any great validity in that. The car was simply dumped in the middle of town and for whatever reasons, mostly usually when people dump a car in the middle of town, it's because they live near where the car is at and have no other way to go home. That is the number one reason. So that's why I look at this and go, what's the guy from Benton? Because he is that why he might know where they live, might know who Keith is, might know the family, might know where the college is. This whole area might understand how everything works and just simply had to go home. Once he killed them off, he's like, yeah, okay, I got to get home. I'll just dump the car and I'll walk, whatever, you know, 10 minutes to my house. That is more likely to me than any other story because I, because I can't understand why the car's in Benton. When it should just be left at the damn field. If you got two cars, the other car just takes off. Leave the car there. <laughs> but that's a very good question. Um, uh, Killer could have parked in town and asked someone who lived there to pick him up. Well, if you got somebody who's willing to pick you up with blood all over you, uh, this is an interesting problem. Uh, it's another problem in this case. How much blood did the killer or killers have on them? When you beat somebody with a baseball bat a lot, generally speaking, there's, you know, you're, you know, Blood is coming back at you. Blood is getting on you, especially if you're raping somebody in the process. And the woman's having a baby. I'm going to say, there's blood, a lot of blood, right? You take this guy and you shoot him in the head. Let's say you're in the car and you shoot him in the head and you're going to get blood spatter on you. Let's say you take him out and shoot him. You still might get blood spatter. And you're going to lean down and you're going to get blood spatter. Um, one or two people have a lot of blood spatter. Two. So, are they wandering around town with blood spatter? <laughs> Are they getting on a blood a bus with blood spatter? Are they asking, hey, hey, honey, can you pick me up? Don't mind me that I'm full of blood. I don't know what the blood spatter pattern is, too. Like, did the blood spatter come out of the house any place? Was there any other sign of blood anywhere else? No clue on that. Um, if a person spent enough time in the house, they could have showered. Uh, they could have changed clothes, but we don't hear anything about somebody, like, taking Keith's clothes and using those instead. I don't hear anything about that. Again, is that a secret? Or we, it just never happened. Um, if you're going to jump on a train, um, by the way, this is an issue with the Tommy Lynn Sells case. Oh, yeah. So the, you drive this car to town. Well, if you if you don't want to be seen, you drive right next to the train tracks. You drive right next to the highway so you can hitchhike. If you're hitchhiking, how are you going to get in somebody's car with blood all over you? So I'm, I'm, I'm not buying the hitchhiking thing. So, okay, you're on the train. You're jumping on a freight. Um, yeah, you can do that with blood all over you. But you would, I don't know why you'd park in the middle of town and then have to walk all the way over to the train tracks because the train tracks are not in the middle of town. They're there, but they're like 10, 12 blocks away. So you got to walk through town with blood all over you. So that's a little bit questionable. Um, uh, Midgey says, maybe Keith became entangled with a young woman. She called at his house with a bogus request to use the phone to cause mischief. And that's why I refused to let her in. That is a that is a theory. Um, 
the theory that here's one group of theories that Keith was cheating on his pregnant wife, got a girl, got a other girl, somebody else's wife pregnant or pissed somebody, somebody's husband off. And that's why this all went down. But then the wife wouldn't be involved. Okay, so why would the girl come? And again, I don't know when the girl came, whether it was one week before or two years before. No clue. I do think it's interesting, but I just have no information on it. Um, why no biological evidence? Okay, good. That's a good question. Um, they're still, I think they're trying today to get DNA. We're talking 1987 and things weren't as good back then. The guy cleaned up. Yeah, none of his blood. If he didn't hurt himself, then his blood would be there. Uh, if they can't find his car or his house, they're not going to find the, the the blood of the victims connected to him. Um, and that's one reason some people think it's Tommy Lynn Sells, because he just scooted out of town. And by the time the police got f figured anything out, he would be like 10 states away and already have changed clothes, ripped them off, stole other crap, and he'd be gone. And so therefore, there, you know, if his blood wasn't at the scene, fingerprints, supposedly, this is again, I don't know if it's true. If if he if I had a gun on somebody and told the husband, you 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 put the duct tape around, supposedly the duct tape was from the house. You put the duct tape around your wife and, and, your, and your son, because I don't want to touch the duct tape. You put it on them. Then you don't have to worry about the duct. You know, why would you be taking the duct tape off of them? If your fingerprints weren't on them, uh, but did you, is that true? Or maybe the killer actually did tape them up and, you know, duct tape is really good for getting fingerprints on. So if he did that, he would say, Hey, I want, I'm not leaving the duct tape, cut the duct tape off, rip it up, take it with you. Um, so that would make sense that if you did it yourself, you take the duct tape. Uh, but there, yes, they don't seem to have any great um, fingerprints, DNA or anything. So that's why this remains what it is. Um, do we know? No. We know they were supposed to kill within an hour, an hour. They say an hour of each other, or maybe two, maybe three. Do we really know? No. No, we don't know the order of death because now here's the thing. If the, if the, well, sometimes we'll have blood at one scene. And it'll be transferred to another location. Like if, if they were killed at the house and then the blood went, their blood went into the car, then you would say they were killed before the car was taken. But on the other hand, the guy could have taped them up, got them stuck in the house, taken the husband off to the scene, killed the husband, came back and killed them. That's what Tommy Lincell said he did. He said, well, I, 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 yeah, I got them under control at the scene. And then I was just trying to take him. So I took him and did these things to him. And then for whatever reason, I felt like going back and raping the woman. I find that a little hard to believe for Tommy Sells. I don't think he, why he wasted his time. He just killed, shoot the guy and just raped the woman. I mean, personally, I find the story a little questionable, but could that have happened? Yes. Or could two people have say split it so that one stayed here and one went here and therefore the blood was not transferred. Yet we do not know. We have absolutely no clue. And this became important to me as to the questions I have. Before this happened, what was the date again? Um, uh, hold on a second. So November 17th, husband did not show up for work. He was supposed to be there at 11 p.m. So he was clearly dead or detained by 11 p.m. My question is where the heck was he? before 11 p.m. This is so important. Like, for example, if he was at home, then somebody had to come to his home, either with their own vehicle or be a Tommy Lynn Sells and just be coming off the railroad tracks and wandering around drinking beer in the woods and saying, hey, that looks like a place I can, I can attack people in. Or did he go into town? Did he go into Benton, for example? For some reason, maybe he had to go to Benton. Benton's only 11 minutes, 11 miles away. I mean, I go to a lot of places. Uh, maybe he had to pick up a check. Maybe he had to make a deposit at a bank. Maybe he, maybe he was visiting a friend. Maybe uh, who the heck knows? It's only 11 miles away. I mean, I'm all over the town. Maybe he was his, his wife was home uh, again. I don't know where she worked, and I don't know what shift she worked. Um, so, is it possible he, you know? In the early evening, it was dark. He said, I'm going to run down to Benton. I got to get whatever. 
He went down to Benton and he got carjacked, guys in the car with him, and takes him someplace. And he's got his keys. He knows where he, the guy lives or he finds out where the guy lives, he kills the guy. And then he goes to the house, drops the guy's body in his woods, takes the car, goes to the house so, and attacks them and then leaves and drives back to Benton. I don't know. We don't have any info. Um, uh, oh, good question. Zero alcohol in anybody's system, zero drugs in anybody's system. There was supposedly a tiny bit of weed found in the house, but the theory is that maybe the killer actually left the weed. You know, it's just a tiny amount. Um, uh, so no. Um, so no, there wasn't anything like that. Um, let's see. Uh, is the evidence gathered in this case available or was it lost like in many cold cases? I have no clue. And I'm sure if it was lost, nobody's talking. <laughs> but again, it's, um, do they have, oh my God, they got, Tommy, Tommy has been, um, he's, he's been executed. Tommy, they have his DNA. There's no question they got his DNA. They know, I mean, Tommy is, okay. Um, let me, let me go on to, <laughs> no, he Dennis Rader was not there. <laughs> Dennis Rader has nothing to do with that, that location. Um, uh, true to say, okay, this is a good point. To disable the guy first because he's the strongest. Yes, usually in a case where you, if you have a killer who comes into the home and what he wants to do is rape the wife, and he's a killer. You know, I'm, not, I'm not a guy who just wants. I'm just, I'm just a rapist. I'm not a killer. You know, if he if he wants the wife, why do you waste time with the husband? Just shoot the guy. Then he's dead. Then you don't have to worry about him. Why why are you taking him away in a car? And doing this, this is one of the most curious things about the case, because it seems extreme. It seems unnecessary for anybody to have to actually bother doing that unless unless they were already in the car with him. Unless that's why I wanted to know, did, was he leaving work during the day and it was a workmate who went with him to his house? Um, did, he was house was up for sale. He was selling the trailer because he wanted to get out of town. Did somebody say, hey, I'm interested in your your. Oh, I, I, I saw your sign. I'm interested. And he said, well, come on with me. I'll show it to you. And then I'll bring you back to your car. Is that possible? I don't know. So was the guy already in the car with him and he got killed on the way home. Um, and then the guy had the keys. So he could just walk in the house or did the guy show up at the house and the whole family was there together. In that case, I don't know why they waste time taking the guy out. Why not just shoot him? And if they want to cut his penis off, just do it there in front of his wife, because wouldn't that be cool? You know, you really, you really want to, you really want to set a scene. Do that. Why would you take them away to a private place? It's, it's just weird. Uh, crime of opportunity for some sick, deranged in, individual. Perhaps that's where Tommy Lynn Sells comes in. Um, uh, uh, why kill the? Uh, uh, why kill the wife and babies? Because it's fun. Because he doesn't care. <laughs> They don't matter. As a matter of fact, it's a big fat thrill. And that's one of the things people just, they can't handle in this case because even hearing about it, because it, you know, we, we can't imagine somebody would be that horrific. But I've seen enough videos of the cartels and, and, and terrorism. I've seen enough people be brutally murdered in the most horrific ways. And that does not leave your head. Don't watch those things, okay? I watch them for professional reasons. And it never leaves my head because it, it, it can't imagine. They're laughing while they do it. When you watch somebody slowly cut somebody's head off and then play with the head and then put it on their stomach, what kind of human being does that? And then they all laugh. I've seen enough of this that I can tell you human beings can be so... Horrific. All right. Out of proportion. It reminds me of the Memphis three level of violence. More than one person egging each other on. This is a good point, Kurtz. Um, sometimes it helps to have two people because the two people get the thrill out of saying, oh, look what we're doing. This is really cool. You do that. You, know, you can also control people better. So you have two people at the family home. One can control the husband. The other one can tie up. The, uh, uh, they use duct tape. Uh, duct tape the, 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 the mother and son. And then they can play around, do whatever they want. But the only question I have about that is why take the husband all the way, a mile away to a field? I, unless, 
okay, see, that doesn't even make sense to me. So theoretically, he could have been killed and emasculated at the house and then put in the car and taken to the field. But why bother? Why bother? You already, you're, if you do what you did to them and the little baby, why would you waste your time being like, let's hide the husband? Um, that makes no sense. So it's, there's a lot of things in this story which are just so bizarre. Um, yeah, I don't know. But we don't know. We, we don't know what's going on with the, the handling of this case. I do not know. Um, uh, if you're a killer, you would have to think about the logistics after the fact, unless the psychopath doesn't care. You have smart psychopaths. You have I don't give a crap psychopaths. And you have things that go wrong psychopaths. And you have lucky psychopaths. <laughs> you got all these different things. You really do. You absolutely do. Um, Sylvain says, I think it was two young men, sadistic psychopaths, deciding to commit the worst possible crime. I think the pregnant mother was a target. I, I don't know why she would, because if she was a target, why are they, why are they doing that, to, this stuff to the husband? So, Really, you know, as a criminal profiler, people would like me to have that answer. It's like, well, they you know they had FBI profilers came in, couldn't figure this case out at all. And, and I'm not in agreement with a lot of FBI profiling. But I, I'll say, I, I understand, dudes. It's a problem. Now, let me stop here and go to Tommy Lynn Sells, because this is the number one suspect. And I want to show you why he's the number one suspect. And then I want to show you why he may not be the guy. And I'm not saying he isn't the guy, because <laughs> he's, this is kind of, some of this is his style, but some of it isn't necessarily so. And the people who have pinned it on him have ulterior motives. And this becomes a problem. Whenever you hear stuff, um, some people have even said they've gone around the internet and found that this case was closed and it was closed because they're saying Tommy Lynn Sells did it. Now, Tommy Lynn Sells is a royal piece of garbage. Okay, so let's let's be fair about this. Um, let me see what other pictures I have here. Uh, okay, so here we have, here you can see his name is right there, Tommy Lynn Sells, and there's him with a hairy chest. All right, so let's talk about who Tommy Lynn Sells. Oh, I thought I got rid of the hairy chest there. <laughs> I don't know. It's a nice, it's always a, remember the Tom Selleck thing? It used to, it used to be, men used to love to have hairy chests and now they like they try to get rid of it. But anyway, this is Tommy Lynn Sells. And this, I'm going to tell you who these people are here. All right. The, what we have, the, the two people here, Diane Fanning, who wrote a book called Through the Window. Now, Diane Fanning, mind you, I, I did a lot of, um, we had a, we had a group called Women in Crime, Inc., which I ran for many years. Um, Diane Fanning was one of the people who contributed. She's a true crime author, a very nice person. And, and I disagree with her on a couple of cases. And, you know, again, as I always say to people, it's okay to disagree with another professional. She's a crime writer. I'm a profiler. We happen to disagree. Doesn't mean I don't like her. I hope she still likes me, especially after I talk about her book. <laughs> Sorry, Diane. But anyway, so she wrote a book on Tommy Lynn Sells through the window. It's called because Tommy Lynn Sells had a habit. He was a okay. This guy is a is is a slime bag of the nth degree. He like um he 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 was a burglar, a robber, a rapist, a serial rapist, a serial killer. Um, he sometimes hopped on trains and hopped off of trains and moved as a kind of a drifter from town to town. He did drugs. He sold drugs. Uh, he stole carjack. I think he carjacked at the time when people just stole cars. They didn't carjack. Um, he was an all around piece of garbage and very, very vicious, very vicious. And the case that brought him down, uh, pretty horrific, um, he uh, climbed in a window of a, of a trailer. He seems to like trailers, so keep that in mind because that is interesting. Uh, otherwise, he finds people who are a little bit isolated because, you know, when, now trailers aren't always isolated. Uh, somebody got a trailer park and they're quite close together, and other times the trailers are quite distant. And so he liked those trailers because he could, you know, they were sometimes up against woods and things like that. Climbed in a window of this family and he met he checked out all the different rooms and saw all the different kids and he picked this one room and he started, he got in bed with this one girl and teenage girl and um, started sexually assaulting her. And the girl above saw, you know, it was her friend and they, she was like, Oh my God, what's going on. But anyway, meanwhile, he cut the throat of the girl, stabbed her incredible amount of times 
and the girl up at top, he told her to shut up and he went after her, cut her neck, but apparently her windpipe actually stuck out on both ends, but he didn't actually cut, um, cut through enough to, um, to, to actually get in, you know, cut her artery, uh, and, and have her bleed out. So she managed, she knew her friend was dying on the floor. And so she managed to, she thought all whole, she thought everybody in the trailer was dead. So she, she actually managed to go up, not to the next trailer because they didn't like them. <laughs> and they went to another trailer under the porch and banged in the middle of the night. And they opened up and found this girl bleeding to death on their porch. And uh, she was amazing because they, they met, eventually the ambulance came, the police came, they met a vector. Um, and when she was, she was, when they had saved her life, but she was like, almost didn't make it. But as soon as she opened her eyes, she was like waving and saying, I want to write things. And she actually drew a picture of them. <laughs> that girl. She was like 10 years old. She was amazing. Um, and they went back in the house and they found the other girl was dead. And they were, some of the, the family had no idea what happened because he snuck into the window. That was his thing with a big, huge knife and um, attempted to rape and kill. So he was, He's, he's a piece of work. I mean, it's, there's no question. He moves around the country. He, he has all kinds of MOs, and, but he has some basic MOs, all right? His number one thing is raping women. Oh, uh, shall I say, he prefers raping younger women, like young girls, like prepubescent, you know, not, not necessarily little girls, but um, what, you, what you would call, um, a, what's the term now? I always forget it, um, a, a feeble file not pedophile, a feeble file. He likes the teen, young teens. Um, and then he kills witnesses. He has no problem just chopping the living heck out of everybody. So he's, he's, he, he's very, very violent. Now, so, so, uh, so Diane Fanning wrote a book about him and she actually communicated with him in prison and he told her stories because he's a storyteller. And he was on Texas, he's on Texas death row for those murders of the murder of that girl. And he, he was executed for it. So while he's on Texas and, and, and death row, he was like confessing to like everything because he was a serial confessor along being a serial rapist and a serial murderer. He's a serial confessor. In other words, he pays attention if he can come up with, he, he plays people. So if he can play them and he can then post, postpone his execution, it, it serves him well. So he told her, he, well, first of all, he did tell, he did tell the local police that he was the one that killed the Dardines. And he apparently came up with a bunch of stories that were really questionable. Okay. Let me see if I can find the questionable stories that he came up with. Now, this is what he said ha happened. Okay. And then I'll get into why this guy plays such an important part where she plays an important part. Um, okay. Uh, this is the apparent Tommy Sell, Lynn Sell's confession. Another serial killer in Texas would soon bring himself to the attention of investigators in Illinois. On the last day of 1999, so we're talking, you know, 12 years later, Tommy Lynn Sells cut the throats of two girls near, near Del Rio, Texas. This is what I'm talking about. One survived and helped the police identify him. He was eventually convicted and sentenced to death for that murder and another one earlier in 1999, where he killed a girl in San Antonio. While he was awaiting trial on the first murder charge, he began confessing to other murders he had committed while drifting around the country, sometimes by hopping freight trains as well. One was the Dardeen family. Sal said he did not remember the details of all the crimes he committed. And okay, let me stop there. Actually, sometimes they don't. And, and people will say, well, if they committed this kind of outrageous crime, they remember every detail. If you do enough crimes, you remember crap. So let's say, for example... You got a guy, a female or a lady, and you go to bars occasionally and you pick up somebody and you bring them home and you have sex with them. I would say if you did that once every two years, you might remember the person. But I'm going to say if you do that every week, <laughs> you know, you may have no clue who you slept with. You know, uh, so you kill enough people and you start blend, you start forgetting, you blend them together. It's not that important to you. So even though you enjoyed it at the time, you you know, you're like, okay, that's done. And now you move on. So that he wouldn't remember every detail, I'm okay. I, I, that I get, okay? All right. So uh, he doesn't remember all the details of the crimes, it, but he described as a cope, which he describes as a coping a strategy. Now that's a complete fat lie. Um, and he claims he has sexual abuse in his child. And he may have. I don't know that matters. All right. So 
he was living primarily near St. Louis, roughly 90 miles uh, northwest of Jefferson County, and making money from working at traveling carnivals and fairs as a day laborer and through theft. This is important. Through theft. In the house of the Dardines, there was money on the table, jewelry, uh, cameras. No, nothing was stolen. See how that's interesting? If you're gonna, if you, you know, you're off the family and you're a thief and you're a drug user, why wouldn't you just take crap they got in the house? Because that's what he usually did. That's one of the strikes against believing that he did it. Um, uh, for the latter pursuit, the theft part, he hit, often hitched rides with truckers or hop freights without any particular destination in mind. And then when he just show up someplace, right? It was through these modes of transportation, he became familiar with the Ina area, or so he claims. One, uh, one trip through Jefferson County in, in November of 1987, he claimed in 2010 to have met Keith at a truck stop near Mount Vernon or in a different retelling at a local pool hall. In both versions, he says Keith invited Sells home for dinner. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. This is a guy who wants to leave the area because he's concerned about the violence in the area. He was very protective of his family. He's a church guy. And he's going to, I, okay, that he went and played pool, that I can believe. So this is a question I have. Where was he before he was supposed to go to work that night? Could he have gone to a pool hall at 6 o'clock at night, played a couple games of pool? He could have. Could he have run into this piece of crap? Maybe. Did he invite the guy home for dinner? I doubt it. A complete stranger is going to invite home to his... Nah, that I don't buy for a minute. So then he says, Keith invited Sells home for dinner. Oh, he also went on a truck stop. What was Keith doing on a truck stop? But anyway, after the meal, so after the meal, so he brings him home because, and he, so now let's have dinner with the family, right? I don't know if there's any proof that dinner was even made, that there were extra dishes. Again, we don't have any details. Sells was simply, simply planning, <laughs> so psychopathic. Now this is Wikipedia, but simply planning to move on. But then Keith allegedly triggered his anger by sexually propositioning him in one account to a threesome with Elaine. <laughs> so, hi, stranger. Let's have a threesome with my eight-month pregnant wife. Seriously, get out of here. So this pissed him off so much because, you know, he would be totally offended by a guy propositioning him. That disgusted him. <laughs> okay. He forced Keith at gunpoint to drive to where his body was found killed and mutilated him, then returned to the trailer to kill Elaine and Peter, who were witnesses. Okay. The witness part I'm good with. Although he says it was at that time the result of uncontrollable rage that Keith's alleged sexual offer had set him off. I was just so pissed at, just took it to the maximum limit. Rage doesn't have a stop button. All right. Now, mind you, she's all. they're also tied up and Where's the part about possible? He tells Diane that he raped. He, he tells Diane that he raped Elaine. He does say that, and he stuck the bat in her. But I don't know. Here's the problem I have here with Diane's book. I'll tell you that. Diane is telling a story. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to read you um, just a speck from that story. Uh, not because I'm not going to read you much of it, but I want you to hear the tone. And I want you to understand that, um, uh, let's see, okay, here we go. Um, the tone of this, I do not see footnotes. I do not see that this is a transcript from a phone conversation with him. I do not see that he wrote this down. What I see is she got information that supposedly he either said to her or that he said to the to somebody else. And I'm going to bring this guy in in a minute. He said to somebody else, and she's taking that and dramatizing it. So he says here, uh, Sells raised little Peter's baseball bat high into the air and slammed it into the head of the three-year-old three lying small and bound at his feet. Ele Eileen struggled to her feet and rushed at her tormentor just as he raised the bat again. This time he only grazed Peter's head. He shoved Eileen backwards. Hands bound, she lost her balance and fell to the floor. He raised the bat over Peter and hit him again and again until he was certain the child was dead. Then he turned back to Eileen. He hit her once, then raised the bat to hit her again. He paused. Something unusual was happening. Eileen had gone into premature labor before his eyes the baby, baby was born. 
Okay, then he, she's pleading at him. He picks up a knife. He supposedly slices her breast. Then he turns to the baby and raises the bat high and beats the baby to death. Um, I left out something. Who knows that's what happened? Who, there is no proof that any of that happened. Either he detailed that's how it went down or they're making it up for, for you know, they're just putting things pieces together and making up a story. Because we have, first of all, he's a liar. Uh, he's, a, he's a pathological liar. So we don't know that anything he says is true unless the, de unless the actual, um, unless the actual evidence can support that. I don't know. Um, so he does say he sexually assaulted her with a bat, leaving it lodged deep inside her. Did he say that or did that come from the mother said somebody else said that? So, you know, I don't know where all this information is coming from or whether it's not actually even true. Uh, and so, Diane got information from someplace to put in her book. Now, she truly believes he committed way more crimes than I think he committed that he, because it makes, a, in my opinion, a really good serial killer story. Um, she also uh, believes in the book, she has the story of, um, that's, um, that's uh, Julie, I mean, let me get it here. Julie, uh, I forgot it was a Ju Julie Rea. Um, I actually, I'm going to put the link below to my actual, I did an actual whole, uh, a whole video on this. Uh, Julie Rea, I think, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Um, uh, yes, she was convicted. Uh, and let's see, that's her picture with her little son. In 1997, Julie Rea, I think that's how you pronounce her name, I'm not sure. 10-year-old son Joel was brutally stabbed to death in the middle of the night by an intruder. The crime shocked uh, the small town of Lawrenceville, Illinois. Uh, but in 2000, Bill Clutter, a criminal defense investigator with Innocence Project, uh, was contacted by Indiana criminal defense attorney, Catherine Leal. Uh, and then they're trying to now save her. They say she was wrongly convicted. And that what really happened was Tommy Lynn Sells was the one that killed, killed the little boy and she was wrongly convicted. She was found, um, she was, uh, found, um, she went through the whole thing. Uh, they acquit, they acquitted her in 2006, found her not guilty of killing her son. And to this day, he says that Tommy Lynn Sells did it. And so does Diane Fanning. Now check my link below on that case. I do not believe Tommy Lynn Sells had anything to do with the murder of that little boy at all. And I go through the entire case. I think Julie killed her son. I still believe that. I mean, she's been, she has been found not guilty by a jury and legally she is not guilty, but I don't find her story holds any water. I don't find any evidence that Tommy Lee Sells was even in town. I think it's nonsense. I think that that was used by a clever innocence project guy to get her off. And she did. But in the book, you also see that Diane is on board with he, that he killed her too. I mean, he killed that little boy too. So Diane is writing a book on a serial killer and she's, she's got all these different scenarios where Tommy Lynn Sells claims he killed people and she dramatizes it. But I don't see that she's putting in the footnotes or in the bibliography or proving that this is coming from anything absolute, that this is just from the mind of Tommy Lynn Sells or somebody else like Bill Clutter, who just likes to, he's, he said, he's an innocence lawyer. He'll come up with anything. And I'm going to go through, I want to say this. I'm going to go through, um, hold on a second. Just trying to find out where I put this. Um, I, I am going to, I want to read you from the affidavit of Bill Clutter about him and the Dardeen case. This is going to be my final part of the show. And you're going to see how ridiculous some things are when people say, oh, well, he figured all this stuff out. No, he's making stuff up the most ridiculous, illogical conclusions, linking things together that cannot be linked and then making an absolute claim that that proves he committed the Dardeen murder. And on top of that, another murder that happened a year prior to that, which is also no evidence he committed. So not that he's not a horribly bad guy. All right. Let me read you the rest of the story about him and the Dardines. So now he had two versions. The third version that he gave about the Dardines. He dispensed with the encounter with Keith and the sexual proposition. According to this account, now he gets off a freight that he hopped near Ina. Why would he hop near Ina? He should be hop off 
I don't know. Anyway, when he saw the Dardine trailer with its for sale sign, now I want to know where he, where did he hop off that he would end up at their trailer? That's something I want to know. But he doesn't say much about that. He saw an opportunity for a killing after drinking beers and waiting for the right time. Now, mind you, there's some stories about how he likes to drink beer and sit in the woods. And, and oh, my God, in another crime scene, they found Budweiser cans as well. It's like, do you know how Budweiser cans are? like everywhere. So just because there's a Budweiser can doesn't say Tommy Lynn Salisbury's drinking it. Um, it's just nonsense. So anyway, dr after drinking beers and waiting for the right time, wait a minute, did he have, how do you get the beers? Wouldn't you have to walk into town to get the beers? And then why, if he's in town, how would he find the Dardine? Okay. Again, this is all just stuff he's saying. After drinking beers and waiting for the right time, he knocked on the door and told a wary Keith he was interested in buying the trailer. So when was this? So again, when was the last time Keith was seen? This bugs me. When was the last time his wife was seen? When was the last time his son was seen? When was the last time Keith was seen? Where the hell were they? The entire, if he went to work at 11 at night, where the hell was he all day long? Were they at home? Were they shopping? Was Julie, I mean, was uh, Eileen working? What, what? Elaine, sorry. Elaine, was Elaine working? Where's the boy? Was he in school? What the heck? Why is there not one shred of information on the entire day? That led up to the moment that they were then attacked. I don't know. So anyway, now he's saying that, you know, he's saying, well, no, Keith's at home. And I'm knocking on the door, what, in, in the middle of the night, saying, I want to look at your trailer, some, some creepy dude that doesn't have a car. And he doesn't have a car, right? So he just, what, he just walked up out of nowhere. Okay, so anyway, Keith is a, a wary Keith was interested. He was told me he was interested in buying the trailer. Then he then overpowered Keith and made him bind and gag his wife and son with duct tape. And if he made Keith bind the wife and son, I don't see any reason why I'd be removing the tape because his he wouldn't have been the one that put his fingerprints all over it. And forced him to drive his car to the nearby to a nearby field. Where? How would he know where that field is? Why is he going all the way a mile south when the, the husband lives next to a field? <laughs> you know? I mean, he lives in a freaking field. <laughs> remember the picture i'll show you the picture again the dude lives in a field and he's got to go a mile away next to a college to dump him in a different field don't i look like a field to you i mean really i'm not wasting my time driving that guy any place i mean come on now all right so <laughs> does this make sense not my opinion all right where he sliced off keith's, keith's penis telling him he was going to take it back to elaine then shot him and left it there left the penis there. Okay. So now we're hearing a different story that what was it just tossed upon the ground? Was it put in his mouth? Where was it at the trailer? He raped Elaine. Oh, now he's saying he raped Elaine before he didn't rape Elaine. According to Daniel's book, he didn't actually rape her. He just stuck a bat in her. Um, then he beat Peter Elaine in the new. Oh, then he beat Peter Elaine and the newborn to death. After cleaning up, he drove his car to Benton. Why? Why is he driving Keith's car to Benton? I mean, he has a, it, no reason to go to Benton because the, the railroad track runs right past all the towns. Why wouldn't he just, if he's jumped off a train, why wouldn't you just leave your, the car near a railroad track or someplace or just close enough? Then you just walk a couple blocks and jump on the train. Why would you put it in the middle of town with your bloody clothes and then you have to walk all the way out of town? I mean, this makes no sense. This is what drives me crazy about the supposed this makes sense. All right. Now, one other thing, supposedly, let's see, um, to the, some investigators, he, they just thought he, they never charged him. They, he remained a number one suspect. Um, they said he, some people, he might know, he knew a detail of the crime. There's only one detail he supposedly knew of the crime that wasn't known by other people. Now, this is the supposed detail. And that was this, that in the house, there were watermelon dishes. This is a popular dish that was around in that time period, especially in people in small towns. Now, the question here comes down to is people say, well, how would he know that? that that's proof. Well, A, he, a whole lot of people had those. Did he just guess it? And they, what was in the house? Oh, some watermelon dishes. All you have to do is say uh, like 10 different things that are likely to be in the house, especially you've been in enough trailers, you know, because you're a thief. You can just mention a whole bunch of things that a woman and that time would like to have in her home and maybe one of them will match or, 
And this is what people don't understand can happen. Let's say you got, I'm not saying this happened in this case, but let's say you have a detective in the case who believes he's guilty. And he says to him, did you see watermelon bowls? And he goes, yeah, I did see watermelon bowls. But he writes it down as he said he saw watermelon bowls. And he never mentions that he actually told him that. He gave him the information because this will help lock it in that he's guilty. This happens. Information is sometimes fed to people. So I don't know whether he saw watermelon bowls when he was on home or whether he was never there and guessed it or whether he was fed the information. So anyway, they said this. Um, they don't know whether he actually did it or not. So it says, I know people have got their doubts. Uh, it said cells. Yeah, okay. But I did it, you know. All right. He was trying to get, at that time he was on death row. And if he could have gone to Illinois, he would have gotten a chance to not be executed as, as quickly. They they turned it down. They just said, yeah, forget it. And so he got executed. So it, that didn't work. But that's, and and Joe, the mother of uh, Keith originally thought he did it, but she's changed her mind. She doesn't really think it's true that he actually is the one. Now, is he violent enough to commit the crime? Yes. Has he... He had another crime. He, he used a baseball bat to beat a kid to death. Why? Because baseball bats are, are, are available in almost all homes that have children. <laughs> because if you came to my house, I have two boys. I have more than one baseball bat. So one of the questions that was asked, um, Sky Ricky asked, is that don't serial killers always bring their own stuff? No. Sometimes they bring stuff. They Whoever came to this crime did have a gun. Uh, they also had a knife. So those are two things that were brought to the crime. But sometimes they're going to use whatever's in the house. Like they they might use duct tape that's in the house. They might use a, a baseball bat. And a lot of times he would just not even bring a knife. He'd just go into somebody's kitchen and grab one of their knives. Why carry a knife around if you got an available knife in the kitchen? As long as you don't leave your fingerprints on it, you don't have to ditch the knife after you leave the house because it's their knife anyway. So a lot of times they will use what's available. So he's violent enough. I don't have a problem with him beating a, a mother and child to death and beating a baby to death. I don't have, I don't really have a problem with killing everybody in a most brutal way. I don't have a problem with him being the type that would do it. My problem is, was he even in the area? Was he in the area? And why would the car move to Benton? That's bothers me a lot. Why was the, why was the husband Keith? Why was his, he taken to a field a, a, a mile away where he then was killed theoretically, and his penis was cut off. Why even bother to do all that when he can just kill him in the house? Why? So I have a problem with that. Uh, so the car movement and the husband being taken away from the family for the for that particular killing, I don't think matches Tommy Lynn Sells. Now, I want to read you what this guy said, because this gets really interesting. And this will be my last bit before I go to all your comments, because I know I'm... I'm, I'm I wasn't going to, there's like nothing to say about this case. And I find a lot to say. So anyway, this is Bill Clutter, private investigator and innocence project guy. All right. I want to read you from the affidavit because this is, this is a learning experience for anybody who's in this, uh, who wants to learn about criminal profiling and investigations and whatever. All right. All right. Let me, hold on a second. I got to pull it up. I, I just couldn't believe this guy's, this guy's thinking process boggled my mind how this was in an affidavit and you're going to be a professional and you say this crap just unbelievable okay now it's a 14 page affidavit i'm not going to read all of it to you you say thank god but let me see what i can pull up for you the affidavit of william clutter that's this dude uh it's uh in the matter of herbert whitlock this is a guy he got off of death row okay is a state of illinois prisoner review board Clutter says, I'm a licensed private detective and I'm director of investigations for a national project called Investigating Innocence. Uh, the mission, it's a mission of our not-for-profit organization to provide investigative support to inmates who they think are innocent. All right. And so anyway, there's this whole story, which I'm not going to get into the other crime, uh, but was a, uh, there was a death penalty of a guy named Gordon Randy Steidel, uh, uh, 1992, um, that he was condemned to death for the murders in 1987. So we're talking about the same time frame. Um, 1987 for the murders of Dyke, D-Y-K-E. It could be Dick. I don't know how you pronounce it. And Karen Rhodes in Edgar County, Paris, Illinois. Paris, Illinois is uh, you know, it's not right next door to um, Ina, but it's um, in, you know it's in Illinois. Anyway, they found them guilty. All right. Now he says he's doing this investigation. 
And now here's where it gets interesting. So he's trying to get these other two, these other people off of a different crime. On April 27, 2011, I traveled to Livingston, Texas and interviewed death row inmate Tommy Lynn Sells. Mr. Sells is a convicted serial killer who resided in Missouri during much of his life. During my interview, Mr. Sells provided information and admissions that convinces me he was the person responsible for the murders of Dyke. Like, I'm going to say Dyke, even though it sounds like maybe it should be Dick. And just Dyke sounds weird. Anyway, um, uh, and Karen Rhodes. I'm just calling them the Rhodes. Okay. The Rhodes, this married couple. It now it convinces him he was responsible for the Rhodes murders. Now, when you have an affidavit and you're putting your name on the line and you're going to say it's con. It, you is uh, his admissions have convinced you. You have to have really strong admissions and evidence. But this guy doesn't. He doesn't care about that crap. Sorry, I'm not fond of. I'm not fond of this guy. He just takes little teeny pieces and blows them up. All right. So what happened here? So, uh, uh, so Tommy Lynn Sells grows up in Missouri. Blah 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 blah, and he's on death row. All right. After his arrest in Del Rio in Texas in 2000, Sells confessed to the murders of Kayleen Harris. That's the girl that was in the house. I said it had a throat cut and all that. Sells claimed that he committed the murder because the father owed a $5,000 drug debt. Well, here you go, Mr. Lying Piece of Crap. Um, you can always blame the victim. So the only reason you killed that kid was because the dad owed money. But the interesting thing was when he went into the house, I believe that child was a visitor to that house, like it was a sleepover. I don't think he knew what the kid even looked like. And it was dark. He was just picking a kid. So garbage on that. But, you know, this is now this guy's trying to link him to the drug, the whole pile of drug trafficking, which then he's going to say also links to the Dardines that Keith Dardine was in the drug trafficking business. This is what he's trying to do, which is completely unethical as hell. But the defense attorney, what can I say? Anyway, so. He says that he killed the kid because the father owed $5,000, which I'm sure he never got from daddy once he killed the kid. All right. He then began confessing to other murders. Sells claims to have killed as many as 70 people over a 20-year period beginning when he was a teenager because he wants to be the biggest and the baddest. Uh, Sells stopped cooperating with Texas Rangers during an incident that occurred in Nevada, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I began my investigation of Terry Lynn Sells in March of 2000 after reading media reports of his confession to the murder of the Dardine family from Ina, uh, Illinois. The Dardine family, a wife and husband and child and infant were murdered. This is unbelievable. Listen again, what I'm about to say. The Dardine family, a wife and husband, this is an affidavit in a court. The Dardine family, a wife and husband, and a child and an infant were murdered by cells on November 18th, 1987. There is zero evidence he murdered them. And yet you're saying he murdered them. I'm going to say you're, you're exhibiting psychopathic behaviors yourself. You don't care about the truth. You don't care about facts. You're just going to make up crap because it suits your case. And the, the police have never, there's never any proof. He's never been charged with the crime or convicted of the crime. You may think he murdered them, but that's a bit different from saying we're murdered by cells. I first heard about the Dardine case in 1988 when I read an Associated Press story about the one-year anniversary of the murders. Not long after reading this article, I had a conversation from a, with a client from the area who had been charged with trafficking kilos of cocaine. My client had been involved in transporting cocaine from Florida uh, in the area of only uh, to the area of only Illinois during the mid-1980s. He told me that there was a rumor, because, you know, you want to base your conclusions on a rumor, um, uh, that the murders were drug-related. All right. He then began to tell me that the husband's penis had been severed and stuffed in his mouth and that the victim's car was parked in Benton. They, okay. Where the federal courthouse is located to send a message. So you got some guy out there who heard some rumors, and that's what. He, so he's now coming up with this theory. Um, it was a 
let's see, it uh, to send this message. I knew from my previous work of a major drug conspiracy case that was tried in federal court invention in the spring of 1986, that there was a wide ranging federal investigation of narcotics trafficking and that the investigation involved cooperating informants from the area of Western Indiana and Eastern Illinois in Southern parts of those states. I also knew from the discovery from the federal conspiracy case that some unindicted conspir co-conspirators lived in close this town called Danville, which was close proximity to Paris, Illinois, where this other, the one he's trying to get the guys out on, the, the, the Rhodes couple. Again, close proximity. I never know what close proximity means. Is that one mile down the road or 30? You know, all right. Uh, the month before reading about Sell's confession to the Dardeen murders in, in Ina, Illinois, I received information that a confidential informant was now telling me that there was new evidence uh, concerning the murders of the Rhodes. This informant stated that Randy Steidel was innocent and that the murders were carried out by members of the Sons of Silence motorcycle gang. All right, yada, 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 that they're doing crap. All right, and then let's see. Mm, so now they're looking into, oh, so then he hears this. He hears that in the murders of the Rhodes, somebody, somebody told the sergeant uh, that Dyke, uh, Dyke's penis, the man's penis, a uh, Deke's, I, I don't know, is it Dick's Dyke's? I don't know. The husband's penis was severed and stuffed in his mouth, just like the Dardine case, you see. Um, and they dismissed this statement as being inconsistent with the crime scene evidence. Okay, so it's a lie. <laughs> so that didn't happen in the Rhodes case. So now you're trying to put two cases together based on this cut penis and mouth thing when one of them wasn't even true. Didn't match the crime scene evidence, but you don't care about crime scene evidence. All right. However, I recognize the statement as being consistent with the facts in the Dardeen case, but the statement was a lie, you idiot. So it doesn't matter whether the lie matched the Dardeen case when it wasn't even true. This is the dumbest thing I ever heard. So now, after Sells was arrested in Del, Del Rio, uh, da, 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 they asked about uh, the, um, the family in Illinois, and he says he, did fam he murdered a family somewhere. Okay. And then then he says a sufficient, the confession was sufficient enough with details that clearly he did it. All right. Now, how does this get even more ridiculous? Okay. So, Sells, in 1986, Sells was released from the Missouri State Department of Corrections. So, he had been in prison in 1986. After his release from prison, he moved into an apartment in St. Charles, Missouri, with his brother Timothy Sells and Tim's fiance. In 1986, he went to a wedding reception in St. Louis. These things are all so important as to these other cases. Not at all. Um, after the reception, he left and disappeared, according to his family. Paris, Illinois, where the roads, these two people on the roads were killed, is approximately 166 miles from where he was last known to reside, which is a damn long way away. That's three hours away. <laughs> I mean, Three hours away has nothing necessarily to do with anything that you have to do with. I mean, that's a long way away. So now he starts, as I begin the interview, I avoided telling Sells any details about the crime as investigating him. Uh, the investigating, sorry. I began the interview by asking him questions about his confession to, Dardine, uh, to the Dardeen murders. Sells stated that he gave police false information about his motive killing the Dardeen family. Remember the three different stories about what he was involved with, why he was like the sexual stuff and all that? He gave false information because he did not want them to know that the murder was related to organized crime. Sell stated, I told police about truck stops and railroad tracks because I wanted them to think I was a drifter. I didn't want police to think it had anything to do with organized crime. Why not? If you're on, if you're on death row and you can, you can bring down an entire organized uh, or a crime racket, you're, you're not going to be killed that quickly because they want you, 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 they really want you to bring down this huge organization, some big mafia thing, right? That would be much better than saying, yeah, I killed a bunch of people in another state. Who cares? But bring down the mafia? You're going to stay alive. So why wouldn't you want to? You're already, you're already in death row. It's not like, oh my God, if I talk about organized crime, they might send a hitman to kill me. You're going to, you, <laughs> the state is going to kill you anyway. That's stupid. <coughs> Sells admitted during my interview that the Dardeen family had been targeted. He admitted. He didn't admit. He made up. He stated. He claimed. Claimed is the right word. Claimed. But he writes in an affidavit, he admitted as if that were truthful, therefore. 
He admitted during my interview that the Dardeen family had been targeted. He said that he waited and watched the home for some time before he went in. When you step in the ballpark, you better be ready to play. You bring yourself down, your wife down, your kids. He was lucky it stopped at his family. Oh, yeah, Keith Dardeen was so lucky that only he was killed and his wife and his son and his little baby girl. He was lucky. I guess they didn't kill his mummy. All right. Uh, the tone of Sell's voice had changed when he said this. It was conveyed in a serious tone because that'll make it true. <laughs> his statement confirmed the fear that Ruby Dardine's aunt, that Ruby is, uh, is another name for Elaine. Okay, it's her first name. Uh, aunt had been talking about the case. Her fear was genuine. <laughs> what the hell? Okay, during the course of my investigation of Sell's the true crime writer, Diane Fanning, informed me that the family of Ruby Dardine, which is Elaine Dardine, was reluctant to cooperate with her because of their fear of the mafia. You know, lots of stories were going around town, satanic stuff, mafia stuff. People are afraid to talk to people because they just don't know. They're stirring up something that they just don't know what it is. They become terrified, even if it's, it's not realistic. She provided me with email correspondence with a maternal aunt of the murder victim, Elaine Dardine. And she tried to, uh, they, he interviewed her. She informed me my family would not want to get involved. We're afraid of the mafia. Well, I'm sure that he's saying lots of shit about the mafia. Oh, the mafia could have killed you. And now she's like, okay, I don't want to talk. So I'm pretty sure he instigated the whole mafia thing. The mother of murder victim Keith Dardine informed me that his wife may have worked at Joe's Pizza in only Illinois at one time. The remain, this remains unconfirmed. So again, let's talk about her doing something that we don't have any evidence that she did. The owner of Only Pizza Parlor, Giuseppe Joe Truppiano, was also co-defendant in the Pizza Connection case that included his cousin Joe Vitale, who operated a pizza parlor in Paris, Illinois. They were both nephews of uh, the, some head of the Sicilian Mafia. I told the sales that I knew he was not in the habit of carrying identification when he encountered police. I asked him, what alias did you use? And sales replied, I like to use Tony, Ricky, Richard. I use Ricky and Richard a lot. This is, this is kind of like one of these psychic things where they just go, I think the person that did this, his name was a John or it could have been James or Jimmy. No. Um, sales replied, okay, so... I did not reveal any information about the transient who checked into the Hotel France right before the murders of the Rhodes. The guest list had three hotel registries in Paris and they were checked. Uh, the Hotel France, um, no, the guest list of three hotels there. The Hotel France had only one guest registered on July 5th and his name was Richard Smith with no vehicle information. The hotel was nearly vacant and was later remodeled right after this. And so, Sell's answer to my question about his use of alias confirmed that the name Richard Smith was actually Sell's. <laughs> okay. You know, if I were in, looking at this as the court, I would just, I would laugh this guy out of there. That is the that is such garbage as ridiculous. Oh, because he said, oh, I used Ricky or Richard sometimes. And there was a guy named Richard there at the hotel. It's got to be him. That confirms it. Are you out of your, you, I wouldn't hire you for anything unless I wanted to, unless I wanted to get guilty people out of prison, which I think is what you like to do. All right. Oh, so anyway, so that confirmed, um, that uh, he was the guy. Um, and then when I asked him what his last name he would use, he wouldn't answer the question, probably because he didn't know it was Smith. Um, so Richard Smith was his first suspect in the Rhodes crime, blah, blah, blah. Now, going on further, let's see. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, it talks about beer cans in the transit room. Oh my God, the guy drank beer Budweiser too. Because you know, I'm pretty sure that most people in that area drank Budweiser. Maybe Miller, no, I guess. You wouldn't be the right guy if you drank Miller, but if you drink Bud, you're the guy. Oh Lord! Oh, so that's a and there was a beer can in a trash can someplace. I mean, this is how vague this stuff is. Oh, they want to hear something really stupid. Uh, so he, uh, where's this other stupid thing he said? Um, so Sells is talking, um, making a bunch of oh, bunch of stupid comments, and then he says this. Um, where? 
Uh, so that's a long thing. I'm not going to go into all of it because it's, oh, yeah, this is the other one that made me laugh. I left the interview feeling disappointed that he hadn't fully confessed because it wasn't probably him. Uh, but what he did tell me confirmed my suspicions that he was a drifter. Of course it did, because you just are willing to say things are true that aren't necessarily true. When I returned to my office, there was a letter on my desk from Sells. The date on the letter was the same and blah, blah, blah. He said, Bill, I'm going to say, all I'm going to say is keeping you, uh, keep asking if you knew Karen for a reason. I don't even know what this is about. But then he says, see your lawyer friend soon. P.S. Eiffel Tower is nice this time of year. You, you ever been? Now, this, this, is, this is what a clever lawyer who is using proper deductive reasoning comes up with. So he makes a joke about the Eiffel Tower. And he goes, aha. His reference to the Eiffel Tower indicated to me he was letting me know that he was the one that committed the Paris murders of the Rhodes. <laughs> because it was Paris, what is Illinois? <laughs> Not Paris, France, but because he mentioned the Eiffel Tower, that, what was it again? That let me know that he was the one who committed those crimes. <sighs> Can you get any worse than this? So then... One more thing here. Sells wrote another letter to true crime author Diane Fanning. He mentioned my visit to prison. She called and provided me a copy of the letter. And so then it goes about some of his behaviors. And she, Sells wrote her a letter that said he came through a window and somebody had come through a window. It was dark. So, oh my God, it was dark. So since he likes to do things in the dark, that month, the roads were killed in the dark. Therefore, he did it. So, so Diane is prov providing information that he's now connecting those dots, you know, as he does, he don't, he'll connect a dot, even if they can't be connected, it doesn't matter. And a whole bunch of other bull. So anyway, just as absolute nonsense. So essentially, let me go ro roll through this really quickly. Uh, oh, yes, he received information from Tommy Lynn Sells. Oh, no, he received information from somebody that Tommy Lynn Sells, another individual had been contracted to commit the Rhodes murder in Paris. And that came out of absolutely no place. Of course, there's no proof that that happened either. As part of my investigation, I met with the mother of Keith Dardeen. She had been advocating for the prosecution of Tommy Lynn Sells at the time. And um, so she goes on about, and then what you find in his statements here, it says that both have been, duct tape had been removed by the killer after they were murdered. Both had been beaten to death with a baseball bat. During the beating, uh, Ruby, which is the wife, or the, no, of the other name, um, eight months pregnant, went into labor. The newborn baby with the umbilical cord still attached was beaten to death. The baseball bat was found shoved into the birth canal. The mother, child, and baby were side by side. Her son, Keith, was found in a field about a mile from their home. He died of a single gunshot, whatever happened to the two or three, uh, to the back of the head. His penis was severed and stuffed inside his mouth. The family car that he drove was found parked near the courthouse. Now it's not near the police station or in the bank. Now it's near the courthouse because, you know, it's all about the drug trial. Um, 17 miles from where a case body was found, or, or 11, depending. Uh, the inside of the car was bloodstained. These facts would suggest the killer entered the home, bound the hands of the wife and the child, waited for Keith Dardine to come. His wife and family were beaten to death. The killer removed the duct tape, not wanting to leave trace evidence. They were either killed when Keith Dar Dardine came home, uh, which would require at least another accomplice, or they were murdered before he arrived home and forced to see the bloody aftermath of the crime. He then let, was led out by gunpoint to the car, driven to the field a mile from the home where he was killed, where, where he was killed. Although Tommy Lynn Sells has given different stories as to his motive for the murders, Texas Rangers told me they're convinced he's a killer based on the knowledge of things that only the killer would know. Oh, so then he goes on about, oh, that, let's see. Uh, oh, the reason he parked in Benton, he said he also lied to the police because he lies all the time to the police about the reason for leaving the victim's car in Benton. He said he told police the car would park there because it was close to the tracks. Oh, again, so it didn't link to organized crime. Uh, the Dardeen murders were committed a year and four months after the Paris murders. So therefore, it must be that guy. Uh, so he's developed all kinds of sources, blah, 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 blah. The evidence against Tommy Lynn Sells is compelling that he committed the murders for which uh, the others, these other two people were wrongly convicted. So you see, we got a crew, one of my consider, a, a lawyer who doesn't have a lot of ethics and, and is willing to create claims that, accept his claims as proof for things that do not actually match anything. 
Then he hooks up with Diane Fanny, who calls, who's happy to have things go in her book. So they're all working together because they both want to use Tommy Lynn Sells as a, for, for him, he needs Tommy Lynn Sells to get off those two people, the roads. And also uh, Julie, uh, Julie Rea, he used him as a, as the, guilty party for the Julie Rea crime too. And he got Julie Rea off. She, on the other hand, puts both of these in her book saying he committed both those crimes. So she supports this. You see, see how nonsensical this all gets. It, and it's, there's just no proof all the way around. Again, link below to the Julie Rea. Um, I went through that whole crime. I have find zero evidence that he had anything to do with it. And everything points to the mother killing the son. Um, as far as the, as far as the Dardines go, could he have committed the crime? Yes. I don't know where he was. I can't say he didn't commit the crime because he does move around and it's an extremely ultra violent crime. And I, I don't see any reason why he couldn't have done it. I just don't have any proof that he did it. And I don't think that his stories necessarily hold water. So a lot of the stuff, what the, the, what we know was also in the paper. So he knew enough and I don't know what he was also fed. Uh, as far as people wanting to close a case down. Um, my problem with him being the killer is mostly about the, Keith being taken to a field, which he didn't need to be taken to. <laughs> and what was done to him was not his kind of thing. And then the car being dr driven to Benton when this guy could have just jumped on a, just jumped on a train nearby. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So do I know who killed the Dardines? I do not. Do I know what the motive is? I do not. I do not believe the Dardines were involved in drugs. Keith Dardine, apparently it's pretty, pretty clean, everything around him. Nobody had a clue he's involved in anything at all nefarious. Um, could, could, I don't have any clue. There it looks to be, as far as any specific motive at, at Keith Dard, uh, Dardine, I don't know of one. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I just don't know of one. But I feel that that person lived in Benton and they did not come in on a train track and go out on a train track. However, could he have done it? In theory, yes, because the violence doesn't does to some extent match him. Um, so this is one of these crimes where you, even as a profile and investigator, all you have is a, a couple of avenues and you have things that are red flags. And my red flag is the husband being moved to the field and killed or and emasculated there and the car being driven to Benton. Those are the two things that really get bother me um, more than anything else. Um, but I would have to be there. I'd have to see all the police files. I'd have to talk to everybody, find out why they're not releasing information as to what the family was doing the day they got killed. Who was where was, 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 was uh, Keith, um, was Keith driving around? Did Keith go to Benton? Did somebody get in his car in Benton? Um, I just don't know. Where where were these people? You know, where were they? What were they doing? Why is none of this information out there? And uh, I think it's, you know, if the police maybe had given that information up earlier, uh, they may have been able to solve the crime. Somebody might have seen something back then. They might have had a relative or a creepy dude uh, around them that they say there were suspicious things happening. Maybe he did go to a pool. Maybe he did go to a, a place and play some pool and, and somebody, he gave somebody a ride. Who knows? But we don't know because the police have never said anything about what they were doing the day they were killed or the day before they got killed and where the car actually was. Where was the car? <laughs> was it in the bank lot? Was it on the street? Was it near the police station? Was it near? Why is this a big fat secret? So I, I, I have a, I say again, I think my problem with Tommy Lynn Sells is that why would he have found their house when he doesn't live there? Um, why, why would he take the husband back behind a, uh, a college and, and leave him in a field there? Why would he take the car to Ben? How does he even know any of this place? I mean, it could be all be luck or is it somebody who really knows the area, somebody who had it out for him and his family. And I honestly do not know. I can't go any further. I, I can tell you the person's a massive psychopath, extraordinarily violent, extraordinarily sadistic, and very enraged. But 
if if just if I would say just if just the wife had been raped and murdered and the boy killed as a as a um, witness, that I would understand. But I would also think that if he was there, they would just have shot him and left him alone. What what why bother with him? I just don't understand driving him off and and killing and emasculating. I thought that to me is very bizarre. And why? So now, sorry about this. Very long and, and so much, so much. This is such a. It's we have no information yet. It's hugely complicated when you when you look at all the different things around that nobody talks about and nobody even puts together. Or you know, this is all the stuff I found in, in my research. So craziness, absolute craziness. Um. Uh, let me go to comments. If anybody's left here in the chat room after that long, very, very long thing. Um, normally I wouldn't go on that long, but this is just so bizarre and so much to me. I'll say this. I find the whole thing of uh, clutter, the, the, the private investigator and his nonsense fascinating that his affidavit. I find that Diane Fanning hooked up with him and they, she wrote a book and everybody's supporting the Tommy Lynn sells thing and nobody cares about the facts. I find that interesting. So that's a personal thing. I mean, as a, as a profiler, a researcher, I find it interesting when people, especially when it comes down to the Innocence Project crap, that they're willing to find somebody to take the blame so they can get the client off. And everybody's got everybody's got an agenda. <laughs> um, no, not at all. No, Ketty Resort is completely, that's completely different. Yeah. You know, the thing is, sometimes we, we see two brutal crimes and we go, oh, do they have anything in common? Well, that psychopaths did them. <laughs> no, Ketty, Ketty was, Ketty was, I think, a thrill, thrill crime. Um, and that's, yeah, completely different and uh, not much to do with anything. Um, motive. <clears throat> Hi, Benny. Uh, it could be a, some psychopathic guy. Well, absolutely psychopathic guy or guys had misunderstood something Keith had said or done and thought Keith was trying to steal his girlfriend. I mean, you, it's pretty, that's pretty overkill, shall we say to kill an entire family. Now the, now the baby, mind you, as much as people think the baby thing is the worst, that I actually understand. <laughs> That's terrible to say, but if, you know, if you go in there and, and you go to rape a woman, the waterbed is useful for this, okay? The waterbed, a waterbed is not like a flat bed. If you turn the woman over on her stomach, her pregnant stomach actually goes into the bed so therefore, it's much easier for you to rape her. Now, when you're raping her, um, then she's more normal and not so pregnant. This is, I'm looking at it from, from the point of a psychopath. And now you're probably thinking, I am one to even figure stuff out like this. But this is why I look at things when I'm trying to analyze how people, how people think that go through their minds that might be just rational to them. Um, that he wanted to rape her and it might have triggered the actual uh, uh birth um and they say when that baby starts uh, suddenly comes out for a guy who's never seen a birth in his life which he probably hadn't um to see a baby suddenly appear and then start crying and to most people it's gross and disgusting the birth of a baby the placenta and the, you know all this stuff is is is, is, is disgusting to them that's uh, slimy and, and and a little teeny especially a little baby it's not a, a, a strong baby but you're talking about a, a preemie is to them like a little creature a little noisy creature it's just creepy um, that they would kill. That is not surprising to me. That wasn't in their plan. All they were into was whatever else they were into. Um, and the, if the person did put the, the bat inside her, that could be just a response to, well, thanks a lot for doing that to me. You know, that, that kind of concept. Um, and the boy, the three-year-old is only three, but he's you know, theoretically a witness. Um, so, you know, a psychopath will kill anybody. Um, I think it's him that I get more confused about than, than the other two, the other two, and even the baby killing make much more sense to me than this folk, this, this taking him away, sh shooting him. Now he's, he's not being stabbed. He's not it's the same thing is happening. That's happening here. He's being removed and he's being shot and he's being emasculated. Why? What, what's up with that? And that seems to be very much, um, uh, Seems a personal thing. So that's why a lot of people think something happened between him and some other psycho, like a saying Benny, that they they went after him and 
Maybe they were just collateral damage. I, it's really hard to know. Um, you think it's two separate crimes. Well, are you talking about petty or are you talking about this? Um, if it's, it could be two separate people, but it's not necessarily two separate crimes. But again, why, what's the thing about him? You know, I, I, it's hard to say. Um, you think, okay, Olga says, I believe the killer wanted something from Keith. They made him watch his family beaten and they took him for this thing, tortured him with cutting his penis off and he wouldn't break and got killed, possibly. Now, his mother thinks that he may have been, they're trying to force him into the drug trade. I find that very unlikely. Um, that's kind of one of these fantasies people have, some some like, theories they have about how drug drug people work. And they don't they don't try to force some some you know church going local guy in a small town into the drug trade. This makes no sense. Now in, in New Mexico recently, they kidnapped a bunch of um, young men. They applied for a job. Uh, in a place called uh, Cuatro Cienegas, I think it was, which I've actually been to. It's a lovely little town. And they went to apply for this job and then they were kidnapped by the cartel. And they were told, you either work for us or we kill you. And they refused uh, and they got killed. That's a whole different can of worms. But I, I don't buy that he was being forced into any drug dealing. But So I don't know what they could have been trying to get out of him because supposedly this, they could not find a link of that he did anything wrong. And if his mother isn't lying about him selling cans, like he buys things and then sell, resells them so he can make extra money for his college fund. If he's selling cans, he's not selling drugs. <laughs> you know, one pays a lot better than the other. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, even a small preemie baby would not be born immediately, surely. Wouldn't there be a period of labor? In which case the murder was in the house longer than we would think. Mm, there is a claim that the that because of the cleanup time that he could have been there for a long time. Um, he could have been there a long time waiting for the husband to come home. And then again, I want to know where was husband before the, 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 in other words, he was clearly um, dead by 11 PM or he was not able to function past 11 PM uh, was not free to function. So my question is, if they were actually in the house for that long for her to go into labor at some point, if, you know, and yet can labor happen quite quickly? It can under hor horrific circumstances where the body just basically expels what's in it because it's hit with, it's riped, it's hit with a, a club, it, the brain is hit. There's a, yeah, it can happen really quickly. I mean, it can, um, it's a preemie, so it's not a full grown baby. So the, the body can get, release it more easily. Um, she's also had one child before, which is also makes it a little easier. Um, uh, but I don't know. It could have taken 10 minutes. It could have taken three hours. I don't know. Where was she? Where was he? And we don't have any of that information. So annoying. So annoying. Um, oh, Clarissa says, did they not question the town folk to see if they had seen any of the Dardines? Well, I'm, I'm sure they did. We just don't know. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. And when people say, can you look at the Dardeen case? One of my problems has been for like two years that I've refused to do it <laughs> was I couldn't get information. It's just not there. And it's just, and I'm like, and it, to me, as a, a person who would do an investigation, that's the first thing I want to know. I want to know their, their whole schedule. What were they doing? A whole time frame. I want to, I want to know the time frame for the entire week. You know, I want to know when they go to church, when they when they pick the kid up from school, uh, when who they have babysitting him if they need babysitting. I want to know the whole thing so I can see the pattern of living. And I want to know specifically what happened in the 24 to 48 hours previous to this event going down. Um, I want to know, are there things that could, like Benton, I look at Benton and say, is there anything connecting him to Benton? Now, mind you, the the job he worked for was a, was in the a Benton jurisdiction, all right? But it wasn't in the town of Benton. It was halfway between Ina and Benton, right in the middle, like five five miles either direction. Um, but if you're only five miles away from someplace, you may indeed do some kind of business in Benton. Or ha or maybe Ina's, Ina's a smaller town than Benton. They're both really small, mind you. But Benton's like twice the size, at least, of Ina. 
That's where the courthouse is. Ina doesn't have that. So maybe he did go to a pool parlor there. Maybe he had friends there. Maybe he shopped there. I don't know what he did there. I don't know if she worked there. There's just nothing. No addresses, no time frame. And because of that, it's very hard to tell what could have happened when. And then who could have accessed them? I say, did they act, did, did somebody come to their house? If somebody came to their house and the car was taken from the house and then he was dumped and then down to Benton, two things, either somebody had a car going to his house or somebody came out of the woods like a Tommy Lynn sells from a train trip. But on the other hand, if somebody got in his car at some point, they could have killed him and then brought the car back to his house and then gone down to Benton. Or they could have gotten in the car and he could have they could have made him go to the house. I don't know because we don't know where anybody was. <laughs> so annoying. Um, now we don't know this. Uh, the, the no, it's nothing. I said that, no. Um, I want to say this: law enforcement I, people always go to law enforcement stuff. Like all oh, the cops are involved. Uh, they did the crime. No, I don't believe any of that. And I, I, I believe the problem was when they went to investigate, they just had no motive. It was a it was unheard of crime with no motive. I don't know what their investigation entailed. There's a huge amount of um. They've got a ton of uh, you know notebooks in a row, tons of them. And this case has been investigated by more than one group of uh, detectives, and just not got. They just not. They haven't gotten anywhere with it. Um, outside of Tommy Lynn Sells looks like a better choice than anybody else. But other than that, nobody's explained. I, I say, well, I don't know why it's so secretive, like even where the car was parked. That drives me nuts. I, I don't understand that at all. Um, don't you think, Olga says, being overprotective of his family was suspicious and wanting to leave town? Yes, that is possible. Uh, and people have pointed that out. That's like, okay, so suddenly he's like paranoid. He suddenly wants to give up his job and he wants to get out of that town. Uh, and he it was also supposedly willing to move out of the town without another job available for him in the other town. Um, huh, I don't know. I mean, it's possible he some something was going on around him that he it did freak him out and maybe he did become a target of something. Um, maybe he saw something, knew something he shouldn't know. It's possible. Um, it's also possible that he had moved to the town um, and it was fairly new in town. He moved to the town for a job Maybe he and his wife didn't really like the town that much. And they were now they were staying in a small trailer. They're going to have a new kid. Maybe he just said, I want to be near my family. You know, my family lives an hour away. I just want to move back there. Now that I've got some experience, I'm getting another kid. I just want to move back there. And I want to live near my family where the grandparents are. And maybe he was concerned about um, some level of violence around the town. So the question is, was he that paranoid or just people blowing that up? You know, maybe he's just like, yeah, I should get out of here. I don't know as he was really paranoid. Uh, again, unless I do a whole lot of interviews, I don't know the truth of that. It's just because one person said that, that <laughs> doesn't make it true. <laughs> uh, um, um, a small town. Police are likely out of their depth and never had such a crime to investigate. That is absolutely true. Um, it's a pr very big problem. A small town doesn't usually like, they, you know, they, they, they're, they're, they're cops too. They're detectives. They want to do their own stuff. Uh, they don't want the FBI to roll in because nobody likes the FBI coming in on territory. Um, and the FBI sometimes is a pain in the ass. That's just the way it is. And they, they don't usually work in small towns. I mean, unless it's some ongoing serial killer crime that's really big, like Atlanta child murders or something. So they probably thought they could take care of it. Um, and maybe we can't, maybe they did everything they could. Maybe they did a fine job and nobody else would have done a better job. There was maybe there was just not enough evidence. And it was such a freaky crime that they just couldn't figure out what the heck it meant. I mean, I'm sitting here going, uh, uh, you know, some crimes you've seen me analyze some crimes and I'm pretty solid about, I know this is what happened. This the evidence shows me this and this and that. And I believe this is what happened 100% or well, at least <laughs> my, my analysis I'm comfortable with. I don't have one. I don't have one here. I can't tell you whether it was a vengeance crime or some hate crime. I mean, a hate crime. I mean, by hating him, um, somebody had some weird 
uh, psychological thing that they, they blamed him for something and were that crazed that they would take out his whole family. I can't say they didn't overhear something in the mafia when they came, but that doesn't look like a mafia crime to me at all. Um, I can't say that isn't Tommy Lynn Sells or somebody like that, some, some two crazed pieces of crap, one crazed piece of crap. All I can say is I'm bothered by the car movements and the, and the extra focus on him. And those are my red flags. And I would have to investigate. If I went in, if they called me today and said, Pam Brown, can you come? I'll wait till the snowstorms are over. <laughs> can you come in the spring <laughs> when it's nice here? Because I've, I've worked in a lot of small towns and uh, they're small, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's fun to go there when uh, the weather's at least good. And so, you know, would I come in and go through the whole case and maybe I'd see something then and I'd see pieces of evidence and interviews and I I finally get information about where these people were, what the timeline was, what, what they were doing. Would I come up with a stronger analysis and say, uh, hey, and I've done this in some cases. Um, I have gone to towns where on the outside, I'm like, I don't see what this could be. And I'm like, why wouldn't the police know? And then I get there and I review everything. I'm like, wow. Um, hmm, okay. Maybe you are a small town. <laughs> Maybe you just had a couple of detectives who've never worked these cases. But I do see a lot of stuff here. So let me lay it all out. So could I solve this crime? Maybe. Or at least could I point it in a correct direction? Maybe. But from outside, all I got are a couple red flags. Um, and I can't can't get further than that because I just don't have enough information. And what information I have is all questionable. <laughs> um, I don't know. I honestly don't know, Benny. I, I can't say. Um, because there's no way to know, you know, when you're dealing with psychopaths, one of the problems is they don't always work in a proper fashion. They do things because they think it's good, a good thing to do at the time. They do some erratic things. They do some crazy crap. Um, sometimes people just piss them off. Maybe they weren't planning to do a certain thing and then they got pissed off. And that's, that set them off for whatever reasons. Uh, so you don't, it's hard to say, uh, you know, if we, you cannot really get into the mind of a killer all that well. And sometimes even if you catch the killer and he tells you what he was thinking, he's still lying. <laughs> so you still don't understand the mind of a killer because maybe it's not true what he's telling you because they love to blame the victim anyway. So where the collateral damage here could be, I don't know. Maybe there is no collateral damage. Maybe the thing was to annihilate the whole family. Or maybe it was him and then they turned out to be witnesses. And so they took care of them. Or maybe they were doing them and the husband came home. They were like having fun raping and killing this kid. And, and he had the audacity to show up because they thought he was, they thought he was away at work, but he really wasn't at work yet. He was doing something else. He all of a sudden the car pulls up and these two, he's in their bit, you know, killing, raping these. And he walks in the door and they put a gun to his head. Could that have happened? Sure. But why not just kill him there? I don't know why they would waste their time driving him into some other place and dumping his body and emasculating him. I don't, that part is, and why drive to Benton? <laughs> I just, that drives me crazy. But I don't know. You know, sometimes we would love to be able to put everything together. And unless we're like that uh, private investigator clutter who doesn't care about facts and just says, I know for sure and absolutely. Uh, I connected all the dots, even though the dots weren't anywhere near each other. Hmm. <laughs> you have to sometimes accept that it could be one thing or the other. And yes, it could be more than one killer. Um, absolutely. It could be more than, they could have come in their own car and then driven two cars away. Could be two guys in one car. Could be two guys just wandering down the street. That's hard to say. One, one could have stayed the house and one could have taken him. You, you know, there's, unless you can look at the blood evidence, and stuff you wouldn't know but sometimes when you have two together they do egg each other on they get more excited about things um for example it's possible like for example one of them could have held him and the other one was busy raping and killing over here and he's just keeping this guy in order maybe they took turns you know and then once they killed off the family they're like hey let's get out of here and then, oh, what do we do about this guy oh let's just take him and kill him and dump him in the woods and they did that and then they drove to benton I don't know. Could be, <laughs> could be because I don't have, I don't have enough information and details to be able to say, this is what I know happened. 
And I, you know, if I were writing a book, what I wouldn't do in the book is make up a whole scenario, a fictionalized scenario about something I don't know is true or not true. You know, that would be not, not acceptable to me. Um, and again, no idea. The, you know, anybody who tells you, you could just look at a crime scene and go, well, clearly to me, that's just nonsense crap. And um, yeah, nonsense. And no detectives should believe this is true. And no profiler should believe this is true. There's no way to know in this case. Absolutely no way to know. It could be Tommy Lynn Sells just break seeing those. I say maybe he was away and Tommy Lynn Sells just was gonna gonna rape the woman and he saw a woman outside and he she went into the house and he didn't even know she was pregnant because he only saw her from the back. Thought I'm gonna go get her. Who knows? You know we just don't know. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know there's not enough evidence to tell us anything. I say again the 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 overkill with him and the, well he wasn't brutalized outside of the penis thing. He was shot. Interest as somebody shot and somebody bludgeoned. Some people will say that's two different killers. But again, it could be depending on, you know, if he's already bludgeoned, if he's bludgeoned them, he doesn't want to take the baseball bat with him. He's already got a gun. He enjoyed the bludgeoning part. And so he's using the gun on him. He's also got a knife. So using the knife on him. Or did he kill him first with the gun and the knife and come to the house and have a thrill out of bludgeoning? So you see, we can't say we can't we have to we have to accept that and we just truly have to accept certain things that we are never going to know that's a good point keith was a big guy his body was found in another location it's odd yeah he was a big guy um and then there's a question of did did somebody drive him or did he drive the car with somebody with a gun at his head and again i don't know where the blood is in the car i don't know what kind of blood was in the car i don't know whether it was blood spat or i don't know if it was blood in, you know from clothing i don't know what it is again I have no idea. So I can't analyze. If I could analyze how, what the car looked like, where was his body in comparison to where the car would have ha had to pull over? I want to know what that looked like. Would a stranger have any idea to go off a certain road and go behind or wherever it is near that college? Would they know how to do Would a stranger in the area know how to do that? And then would one person be able to get him out of the car? Or was he led out of the car with a gun? and shot and emasculated there at the spot and the blood was just brought back into the car. I, see, there's a million things I don't know. And when I go work with a case and I'm in a town and I'm in the files and I suddenly see, this is, I look at the blood spatter pattern on the car and I go, oh, well that explains that. <laughs> now I know who was in the car. I know how it happened. But without that information, I got nothing outside of a few red flags. Mm. So annoying. Uh, oh, that's a good question. How long do police files stay sealed? Forever. Forever. Um, it comes down to this. As long as it's an open case, they don't have to let anybody look at the files. And because of that, um, some files stay, stay closed for um, forever. Uh, rarely do they get opened up. Um, yes, a conviction makes a difference because once the case is closed, then there's more access to files. And of course, the court case, you can see the whole court thing go down. Um, but yeah, they can stay closed forever. There's, there's, say there's a couple of cases that I, I really want the files on and I've fought, filed FOIA requests and haven't gotten them. And there are some, I have even some closed cases I can't get the files on. So it, it's, a lot of times law enforcement really does not want oversight. They don't want outsiders coming in and mucking around with their stuff and looking at it and accusing them of things and saying they did it wrong. Part of me understands 50% of me says, I know what they're talking about because when people come, it's like being on YouTube. When I analyze a crime and then a whole bunch of people come in who are not profilers, not you guys, you guys are great. When a whole bunch of non-profilers come in, and they start attacking me and they tell me I'm wrong when they don't have the training to do so. That sometimes happens when people start looking at cold case stuff. They start looking through things like, oh, you didn't investigate this. You didn't investigate that. And they're like, there was no reason to do that. Now, what you have is Innocence Project people getting a hold of those things. And that's how we have these people being let out of prison who, quite frankly, are guilty. It's because they go in and they find, oh, for example, uh, they'll say, well, they did not properly investigate all the suspects. And it's because they're looking at this going, I ne never questioned that these people were suspects. 
I mean, you know, you don't question every single person that comes across the plate. You know what I mean? You got a whole town of people. And so, you know, you, you look, you look on the directions that are most reasonable to look at, but the defense attorneys will roll back in and say, well, you didn't even bother to do your job, which isn't true. So I have 50% of me understands why law enforcement is like, just keep those people away from our stuff. And the other part of me goes, but sometimes it hasn't been handled properly. Sometimes we need oversight to be able to, to review and see whether things were not or were missed so we can either close the case or we can improve training techniques. So, yeah, so I'm, a, I'm in both camps at the same time. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, oh, oh, 75 years. You'd think at some point. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes the... Um, Sometimes the files will become available when a completely new team 20, 30 years later comes in. And the reason that happens is because everybody's dead who was originally on the case. And the new team can say, you know, the other, they did, they, we like the guys, but they weren't so good at what they did. So they can blame the previous group without taking a hit themselves. Well, when you get somebody like, for example, has been there for years and years, they ain't letting you look at their stuff because they, they know that you're going to be pointing fingers at them rightly or wrongly, you know? So um, uh, Bluebell says the case is making me nuts now. <laughs> is there a way to interview original investigator? No, no, no. I mean, again, again, there's, uh, I don't do a lot of pro bono work anymore uh, because most of the time it's worthless. And, you know, in the sense that I can go in and pro bono means, as it says, nobody pays me. Right. So the problem is, um, police departments don't want to spend extra money on outside people. And so what happens is if you do something pro bono, sometimes a family will request the police department bring you in and the police department says, hey, she's not going to charge us, she can show up. <laughs> and so I've done a lot of work that way. But I paid my airfare. I paid for the rental car. I paid for the hotel. I paid for my food and I didn't get paid for my work. And I stayed there for about a week. And I used to really want to do this because I wanted to give families another chance to review things um, and maybe bring justice. Um, then I found out most of the time it was, I could quote, solve the case, give a very good analysis or profile that would forward the case. But by that time, it was simply too late that it wasn't going to go there for whatever reasons, uh, because they screwed it up already. They lost the evidence, whatever. And so they would just thank me and I'd go home and they just take my stuff and just hide it and tell the family she couldn't help. And I thought, well, you know, I'm spending a lot of money and a lot of time and I'm not even, I'm not getting paid. And on top of that, I'm not helping the case in the long run. And also, it doesn't do a lot of good for my name when I go work on cases that I'm not getting some kind of um, support from the police department saying she was a very good profile. She helped us out. Even if they don't say how I helped them, it would be nice if they said I did. But, you know, when they don't, the case doesn't get forwarded or, get, you know, nothing else happens, they just say she couldn't help us. <laughs> it's called polit politics, you know. So I rarely do these things anymore, except that a great once in a while, there's a case that gets into my head and I'm like, you know, I can, I'll toss the money. I'll go, I, I would go do it. I would go do it because I'm fascinated. And I just want to know myself, even if it doesn't turn out to be able to be, you know, for anything happening. Occasionally I can work on a case and I can come, I can give the family my analysis that tells them what I think actually happened. Sometimes that can be helpful, even if it can't be prosecuted. So, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> do this one well i have to be invited and i'd have to be invited into the town uh to work on the case and again most of the time they're not going to have outside people come in um because that's the way that's the way law enforcement works in general and uh a lot of times they're much more willing to have a like a fbi profiler come in not necessarily because they think the fbi profile is better than me but because the fbi profiler Often, they, since they're both in law enforcement, they they will keep quiet. <laughs> Whereas they're not sure about me. I'm you know, I'm outside, or I could I could open my big mouth. Now they can make me sign a document that says I can't say anything. Um, they could do that, um, but they they might worry that, especially since I do a YouTube channel. <laughs> they're like, we don't trust her. She'll come in and she might go on YouTube and say we're all we all failed. So I get I get it. I understand that. Um, uh, even if they were required to release an overview of the investigation while still being able to hold withhold pertinent facts. 
but they don't have to, you know, that's the thing is they, that's their case. That's their job. It's their department they're, They've been working on it for years and they're not going to just release that to some person. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, it's kind of, that's the way the world works. Um, and one of the things I, I try to help people understand in an educational channel is that it, it, <laughs> I want you to understand things and things are not perfect. Nobody's perfect. The detectives aren't perfect. The police departments aren't perfect. The families aren't perfect. Families will lie. <laughs> you know, they'll lie like crazy. Some families, some families, they just tell the truth, but a lot, some will lie because they, they don't want to let family secrets out. They won't tell the police the truth. And then you have detectives who are just fabulous at their job. They're just so good at what they do. And you have other ones that are, you're like, oh, hope you don't get too many cases. <laughs> you know, you're just not that bright. You're a really great street cop. You know, you're a nice guy. I'll go have beers with you. But man, your logic is like non-existent. And then a lot of it is training and they don't get training. If they don't get training, they can only do what they can do. Um, and most cases are easy to solve because you see, the who, you know, it's, like, it's, it's an obvious thing. So you just got to make sure that you, you know, dot your I's, cross your T's and don't screw up the, the, the evidence so it can go to court. But then there's these weirdo cases like this. And it throws everybody for a loop because they know what the hell to make of it. They're just like, what the, what in the heck? Now, in the case where Tommy Lin Linsell's finally got nailed, it's because that girl survived and actually drew his darn picture. And somebody said, that's Tommy Linsell's because he lived in town. He lived in town and they knew who he was. So it wasn't great investigative work. It was a credible witness. And the fact Tommy Linsell's hadn't run away. He wasn't like passing through town and was an unknown. He was actually known in town. He was living there with a wife at the time. I think he had a kid there too. He was living there. He was working there. But he had this ha bad habit of like, just like in breaking into people's houses and raping. Um, although he claims it was a drug debt gone bad. Mm, okay. Never. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I just answered. I have no idea. Um, uh Retesting, um, it all depends whether they have anything to retest. It's been 30 years. Um, if there's no semen, if there's no foreign DNA, there's nothing to really retest. Do they have, could they, yeah, money becomes an issue. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with the retesting thing. Of course, one always hopes that with the years having passed and the great DNA we have now, the testing methods that maybe the guy just drooled, you know what I mean? It's like, or he licked her or something, you know, and that would put his DNA there. Maybe would be great. You know, I would, I, I'd be thrilled if they, they did that. I just don't know what the procedure is and why they're doing whatever they're doing. Um, so, um, um, well, you know, DNA is, it depends. It depends whether what you're wearing. It depends on whether you have gloves on. It depends on a lot of things. Surprisingly, there's a lot less DNA on the scenes than people think there is. You know, there really is. And, you know, touch DNA, of course, has become much more important these days. But touch DNA isn't necessarily there. I mean, unless you know where exactly where to look for it. And then sometimes a conglomeration of a bunch of things, and that's a big fat mess. Uh, obviously, if the person's been raped and they left semen, then you got a chance. Uh, in this particular case, let's say the guy raped her and uh, then she expelled the baby at that point, went into labor. Um, there's a lot of fluids in labor. Would they really have DNA from the guy? Unlikely, really unlikely. Um, so I guess no to on the left. Uh, some, I mean, the mom keeps pressing for things to be done. I mean, at a certain point, what happens, unfortunately, and which is why they probably say it's Tommy Lynn Sells, is because they've gotten to this point where they just don't think they can solve the case. And it is that that is that bizarre case so that they just will finally say, you know, not every case gets solved. And we think it's Tommy Lynn Sells. And, we'll, you know, they could close it um, uh, administratively by saying we believe it's Tommy Lynn Sell, so therefore we're closing it with him being the killer. And a lot of people would be perfectly happy with that. I'm quite surprised they didn't do that. So I, I'm not sure why they didn't, you know, because they could get away with it. Um, but if they close it with Tommy Lynn Sells, is, is it proof that he did it? 
Is that a better thing? Or should they leave it open because they're absolutely not sure? And I will give them credit. If they're leaving it open because they actually do not know if it's Tommy Lynn Sells, could have been somebody else. It could be a completely different motive than some serial killer rolling through town. I give them credit for being willing to keep it open when they could find a, an easy way to close and just get this off their back. So give them credit on that. Um, <laughs> can't roll a joint wearing gloves. <laughs> that is true. It depends whether they did any drugs on the scene. You know, there's so much. Again, I I don't have access to the files to say, wow, if only I knew this, I would have a completely different take on this whole this whole case. Um, and sometimes that is very true. As I say, you know, I go in with one, I, I don't have any idea, or I think this is probably what happened. I look at all the files and I go, holy crap, that's not what happened at all. This is what happened. Um, I could completely turn around on this case and have some really great idea but I don't have access. So it is a very frustrating case. It's all I can say. I'm as frustrated as you with this one because it's such a fascinating, horrifying case. And one that definitely there should be justice. It would be nice to know who the heck did such a horrific thing and why. But again, I'm a realist in life and I've had a lot of disappointments working cases where I even know who did it. And the case just stays open. And the killer just keeps walking. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. I know who did it. But what do I do about it? All I can say is this. It's not my family. Because it's a lot harder when it's your family. I mean, I can, as a professional, it, it, it bugs me as a professional because you want your work to serve a purpose. And you don't like to see the bad guy walking around when you know who it is. Um, but I'm also a realist. I can say, well, you know, not, not every case gets solved, but it's not my family. For the family of the Dardines, it's a completely different ballgame. I mean, then it's there's never it's never OK for the case not to be solved. Never. Because it's their family. I mean, I, I can't even fathom what they what the, to lose a whole family like that in such a way and then have it just go on for three decades sucks it really sucks um oh well the real killer if it were if it's not tommy lynn sells the real killer would be out there loving it if they just blame it on tommy you betcha you betcha and even if they don't blame it on tommy he's been such a mo I, I would say the majority of people who looked at this case think it's tommy lynn sells and they're pretty happy with that and they were also happy to say if Tommy Lynn Sells says it's a drug issue and uh, the car was parked near the, the courthouse and and that P, that PI clutter dude says it's it's him, um, they all know best. And so therefore, we're just going to say that he was involved in drug trade somehow. He just it was a good, he just faked it well. So now the family gets to think that their son was involved in the drugs. But no, the internet world is happy because it's Tommy Lynn Sells. And, and the guy, if it's not Tommy Lynn Sells, is going, gee, thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as I talk about winners and losers, yeah, that's the way it works. Um, yeah, this is very true. Year, decades. She, she said she called the police department every day for decades. The police department's probably losing their minds, too. Um, well, no, there's tr that's <laughs> Clarissa. Tommy's dead. He can't defend himself. <laughs> That is true, but that is why it's so useful to blame it on a serial killer. Uh, same thing with the Madeleine McCann case. Well, the guy's still alive, but they still can blame it on uh, Christian B. Bruckner because he's got a bad rep. So they want to blame. They can blame it on him. Now I, I'm surprised they haven't uh, arrest, uh, convicted, uh, charged him with the crime in the Madeleine McCann case because he's such a good fall guy, essentially. Um, but. I always thought they would just pin it on a dead pedophile because once you pin it on a dead pedophile, you know, the, the dead pedophile can't argue. And, and the case gets closed and some people go home happy. So, yeah. Um, but that's true. I mean, well, Tommy opened his big mouth and said he did it anyway. Tommy doesn't have an issue with people thinking he committed more crimes. You know, he gets books written about him. He got his entire book written about him by Diane Fanning. And, it, and for him, it's, it's, it's uh, murder porn, murder porn. And it's like he, he told her these stories or she read them or talked to clutter and got information and then 
fictionalize these things. So when you're reading them, you can see the little bit I read. It's like you're watching murder porn. Um, and you don't think he gets a big ass kick out of that. It's like, man, I love that book written about me. I could read that and get off on it. And some, that's what some killers do. They want to read about their murders because they get to relive them. So that's why I have a problem with a lot of true crime stuff when they redo the crime in such a way that it's, 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 it's porn for, for the killer. And they also know all these other people are watching them commit the crime again or reading about them committing the crime. And they, it's like having an audience to your murder. I think it's rather sick. So I'm, I'm not real fond of that kind of stuff. I'm not. Um, so anyway, whew, that was three hours uh, on a case I thought I had nothing to say about. <laughs> anyway, but, but again, if you, I'll put the first link is going to be just to the news story, which is what, 10 minutes. And that pretty much is a lot of the information. I will link the affidavit for you. Um, in there, uh, I'll put Diane's book, uh, uh, Diane Fanning's book, and if you want to read it, but I, I think I can. Diane, I don't love the book. Um, uh, and uh, what else do I put in there? And you know, a lot of stuff. I had to go through a lot of Reddit accounts to try to get details because I was looking for somebody who had something. But um, oh, and I'll put the uh, uh, the uh, the Julie Rea case that will also be linked uh, below, so you can read how I don't believe Tommy Lynn did that one either. I definitely do not believe he did uh, that case. Um, I can't say he didn't do the clutter. I mean, didn't do the Dardeen case, but I will say, I think the evidence pointed to her and not to, and nothing pointed to Tommy Lynn cells, in my opinion. I thought it was absolutely ridiculous, but she got out and she is free now and exonerated because supposedly Tommy Lynn cells did it. Although I don't see any evidence that he did. So check out that that video if you haven't seen that one. It's a really fascinating case. Um, so that's what will be linked below. Um, <laughs> this was mind boggling. Uh, did you get a headache? I was like, oh, but awesome. Thank you, Clarissa. I mean, it drove me nuts trying to even do this case. Um, <laughs> I knew you'd find something to say about it. Well, you know, you know, many times I've looked at this case and just given up and, and walked away with because I'm like, oh, what am I going to say? And when I found some of the other things, like the, the clutter affidavit and stuff, I saw so many, oh, just other things became fascinating to me, not just the actual crime, but the issues surrounding the crime were, were quite fascinating. So, yeah, that was, that's what you call intense. Uh, it was. It was really exhausting. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad, Olga, because when you do a show where you don't have an ability to just analyze each thing along the way. It's kind of a weird show to do. And I really didn't know what I was going to do with this show. And so it was just sort of what appeared, shall we say. So anyway, <laughs> Lexus, thank you for doing this case. Make sure you uh, guys all donate for this one. If, if you can, especially as it was demonetized, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, it's each, each, uh, not every video doesn't make a lot of money, believe me. Um, and, but you know, everyone does seem to make some difference in keeping the channel going. Um, and so, uh, this is a full time job that I do. And I try to keep getting the, uh, the videos out to you and doing the proper research for them, as opposed to doing a, just a Wikipedia read and then giving my 15 minutes worth of an opinion. I try to actually do a teaching channel. And, uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit tough, and um, but this one, you know, it's like, well, there goes the there goes the money on this video, because <laughs> I just could not monetize it. It was like, and you see from what I've talked about, you can see why YouTube would be squeamish. They're gonna go, oh, the advertisers do not want their advertising on your show, and I'm like, you know, I don't even want to. Yeah, I'm not. I wasn't even gonna waste my time trying to monetize it and say, you know, and then have them shoot me down and put a bad mark on my channel which can happen. So wasn't worth to take the risk. So, but thank you. Uh, yeah. Any, any support would be but grand. So anyway, Oh, aren't you, aren't you sweet? That is so nice. Anyway. Okay guys, that's it. I'm really hungry. I get really hungry after I do these shows. So not after I talk about horrible things, which is kind of curious. I could still be hungry, but it's my job. Um, so anyway, really sad case. Um, and, um, 
yeah, I hope they do. One day, if they, if they ever call me, I would I would I would go out there, just not in the sto- snowstorm. I would love to know the details on this case that are missing. And I've never seen a case with so few details. This is just, it boggled my mind that there was so little written about their history, their family history, their regular life, where they, any of the, anything. It's just, it was crazy to me to just say, you know, not even know where the car is parked in Benton. It's like, just, just throw something out there, you know? Okay. What block are we talking about? <laughs> you know, I don't understand why that's a big fat secret, but there you go. So anyway, thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. Again, if you're new to the channel, please do like and subscribe and click the Patreon link below and join those wonderful people in the chat room who have been great. And I'm glad you were here with me because I wondered if anybody was going to show up for this show. I'm like, maybe it's just too gruesome and nobody will come because you know, it's not exactly a pleasant, no, no, no murders are pleasant topics, but this one was a little worse than worse than many, shall we say. But thank you for being here and I will see you uh, at the hangout this week. Bye.